So let's begin, guys. Let's start. We are going to be discussing all the amendments applicable for your CA Inter May twenty twenty four examination from direct tax perspective. All right. So are you ready? Are you ready? We're going to make this session as productive as we can. We're going to fill it in with as much learning as possible. All right. We're just. 20 days before our examination and today whatever we do has to be productive it has to be exactly from the exam point of view it has to be as well as we can make it so i am going to put in my 200% you ensure that you put in your 200% as well and that's how we're going to make sure that these 3 4 hours in front of us are our best 3 to 4 hours of today yes guys are we ready Yes, so let's begin. Let's start. Um, just letting you know, for, uh, first of all, that the amendments PDF is already uploaded on my Telegram channel. So in case you don't have it, you can see it later from there as well. So do not focus too much on, you know, writing things down with me. Focus more on learning and understanding concepts with me. Don't spend time on writing because whatever I will be writing over here, I will share it with you all after class. The amendments PDF has already been shared on my Telegram channel. So you do your, your entire focus should not be on writing because our objective right now is just that we have to learn things in such a way that we remember for the next 20 days till our examination. Right, guys? So no writing at all. Focus on listening, learning. Keep repeating along with me. Let all of these points get registered in your memory as well as possible. All right, guys. So now I'm uh, starting off with our very first discussion, which is about the income tax rates. Now, the very first discussion, which is from your basic concepts chapter. So our focus right now is on the basic concepts chapter from your material. We're going uh, through the discussion in the same sequence in which the chapters are arranged in your ICI study material in the same sequence. So first basic concepts, then we'll discuss about agricultural income, then 10 AA, then we talk about salaries, I, uh, the five heads of income, then uh, clubbing, set off. So in the same sequence, we'll go. Okay. So talking about the basic concepts chapter. Now in the basic concepts chapter, there are three things I have to talk to you about. First of all, I have to talk to you about the tax rates. Then I have to talk to you about the surcharge rates. And then I have to talk to you about rebate under section 87A. Okay, so three things we have to talk about in a basic concepts chapter. So let's begin our very first discussion for now is going to be all about the tax rates. Now, with respect to the tax rates, with respect to section 115 BEC, I've already uploaded a video just last week, but I'll still, um, you know, discuss it with you just in case you haven't watched it yet. If you've already watched it, it'll be a double revision for you. Now listen, we know very well that our examination, our uh, May 2024 examination, what is going to be the applicable previous year, tell me. The applicable previous year is going to be 23-24 and the applicable assessment year is going to be 24-25. And which Finance Act is going to apply to us, guys? The Finance Act 2023 is going to apply to us, right? Be as participative as you can be in the chat box because that is how we are going to get the required confidence. Because don't you think at this point of time, we are in a very vulnerable state of mind wherein we are low on confidence, we are low on motivation because we're just 20 days before the examination and there's just tension and stress all around. So anything which can give us some motivation, which can boost our confidence is going to be a welcome change. So ensure that you participate in the chat box as much as possible because that's how your confidence is going to boost up. Okay, so listen to me. Now, when I, when I talk about the tax rates, tax rates which are applicable as per Finance Act 2023, we know very well that we have two regimes, guys. We have the normal provisions and we also have the default provisions, right? Now, when we talk about default provisions, which section comes to your mind? Section 115 BAC comes to your mind when we talk about 
in the default provisions. So we have number one, the normal provisions and number two, we also have the default provisions. See, uh, there is no amendment in the normal provisions. Normal provisions, even now basic exemption limit is generally what, tell me, the basic exemption limit will generally be 2,50,000 and in case your assessee happens to be a senior citizen, then the basic exemption limit will be what? Basic exemption limit will be 3 lakh rupees and if your assessee happens to be a su super senior citizen, then the basic exemption limit is going to be 5 lakh rupees so here if you see there is no change there is no amendment in this part so this is not the matter of our discussion the matter of our discussion right now is a default provisions covered under section 115 BAC now under 115 BAC what are the amended tax rates listen to me carefully tell me what is going to be a basic exemption limit first of all everybody under 115 BAC, your basic exemption limit is going to be 3 lakhs. Amazing, guys. Very good. So, if your income is up to 3 lakh, then you will have to pay no tax. What's the next slab? Tell me. See, the slabs will keep increasing by how much? The slabs will keep increasing by 3 lakh, 3 lakh. Very good. And the tax rate will keep increasing by 5%, 5%. 5%, 5% tax will keep increasing. So, your second slab is going to be income is more than 3 lakh, but up to 6 lakh. Here, how much tax you'll have to pay? Here, you'll have to pay 5% tax. Then, what if your income is more than 6 lakh up to 9 lakhs? Here, how much tax you'll have to pay? See, listen, listen, listen carefully. Up to 3 lakh, no tax. 3 lakh to 6 lakh, tell me in between how much income? 3 lakh to 6 lakh, in between how much income? 3 lakh income. On that 3 lakh, 5% tax will be how much? On that 3 lakh, 5% tax will be how much? 15,000, guys. So, 15,000 plus... 10% of the income in excess of 6 lakhs. Can I say this? Do you agree with this? Everybody, everybody, yes, yes, yes. Come on, come on, come on, sit up straight. Following everybody. Yes, so if the income is up to 3 lakhs, no tax. Income is more than 3 lakh up to 6 lakh, I'll have to pay 5% tax. If the income is more than 6 lakhs, then up to 6 lakh, I'll anyways have to pay 15,000 tax plus 10% of whatever income I have earned in excess of 6 lakhs. Then what's your next slab? 9 lakh to 12 lakhs, guys. Here, tell me. Here, how will you calculate? Up to 3 lakh, you don't have to pay any tax. 3 lakh to 6 lakh, in between how much income? 3 lakh income. On that 3 lakh, how much tax you'll have to pay? 5%, 15,000 in your mind. Then, so here you'll have to pay 15,000. Then 6 lakh to 9 lakh, in between how much income? 6 lakh to 9 lakh. 3 lakh income. On the 3 lakh income, how much tax you'll have to pay? 10%. So, 30,000. So, do you agree that if your income is more than 9 lakh, income up to 9 lakh, you anyways have to pay 45,000 tax? Do you agree? If my income is more than 9 lakh, income up to 9 lakh, I anyways have to pay 45,000. How 45,000? This 15,000 plus this 30,000, guys. So, I'll have to pay this 45,000 plus what percentage? Plus 15 percentage of whatever income I have earned in excess of 9 lakhs. Perfect answers. Y'all are giving me amazing speed. Then, what is the next slab? If my income is more than 12 lakh up to 15 lakh. Now tell me again, 12 lakh to 15 lakh guys. So 0 to 3 lakhs, you will ask me to pay no tax. 3 lakh to 6 lakh, on that 3 lakh, 5%, 15,000 you'll ask me to pay. 6 lakh to 9 lakh, on that 3 lakh, 10%, 30,000 you'll ask me to pay. Then 9 lakh to 12 lakh, on that 3 lakh, at what percentage? 15 percentage you'll ask me to pay. That's going to be how much, tell me. That's going 3 lakh into 15 percent. That's going to be 45,000. So you tell me now, if my income is more than 12 lakh, then up to 12 lakh, I anyways have to pay how much? Up to 12 lakh, I anyways have to pay 90,000. 90,000 plus what percentage? 90,000 plus 20 percentage of my income in excess of what? Income in excess of 12 lakhs. Right, guys? And then coming to my final slab, what if my income is more than 15 lakhs? What if my income is more than 15 lakhs? Again, 0 to 3 lakh, no tax. 3 lakh to 6 lakh, 15,000 tax. 3 lakh to 6 lakh, 15,000 tax. 6 lakh to 9 lakh, 30,000 tax. 9 lakh to 12 lakh, 45,000 tax. 
what about 12 lakh to 15 lakh guys 12 lakh to 15 lakh in between 3 lakhs income on that 3 lakh income 20 percent will be how much 20 percent will be 60,000 guys so therefore tell me now if my income is more than 15 lakh if my income is more than 15 lakh up to 15 lakh anyways how much you will ask me to pay up to 15 lakh anyways you will ask me to pay 1 lakh 50,000 tax plus ideally it should be what it should be 25 no but no 25 straight away 30 percent 30 percent of the income in excess of 15 lakh perfect clarity everybody yes guys did you notice 25 percent number is not there did you notice that yes so these are going to be your slab rates as per the default provisions in the normal provisions there is no change as a uh, usual only no change default provisions only there is a change now uh, can we go a little deeper in our tax rates under the default provisions can we go a little deeper over here this was our first discussion. Now answer my second point. What if my assessee happens to be a senior citizen? What if my assessee happens to be a super senior citizen? Then what will the basic exemption limit be? Guys, tell me. Under 115 BAC, come on, come on, tell me. If assessee happens to be a senior citizen or if the assessee happens to be a super senior citizen, the basic exemption limit will still be 3 lakh only. Which means, do you agree that irrespective of who the assessee is, the basic exemption limit for all assessees will be the same 3 lakhs only. Crystal clear with this also. Yes, guys. Then answer my third point, guys. Answer my third point. What if my assessee is having a lottery income, casual incomes and all under section 115 BB? What if my assessee is having unexplained income under 115 BBE? Or what if my assessee is having, let us say, net winnings from online games under 115 BBJ? Or what if my assessee is having section 111A STCG or section 112A LTCG or 112 LTCG? For these incomes also, will you apply same tax rates? Will you apply same slab rates? No. These are called what, guys? Give me one term for this. Give me one language. Some language give me for this. What do you call these sections? Very good. You call these sections as special rate taxation, guys. For special rate taxation, continue to apply the same special rate itself which means can i say that the slab rates will be not applicable to these sections do you agree slab rates will be not applicable to these sections the existing special rate itself will continue to apply will you try telling me the special rates extra revision will happen come on tell me 115 bb guys your casual incomes what's the tax rate Tax rate, tax rate. Ah, 30%. Very good. 115 BBE, unexplained income. What's the tax rate? 60% plus mandatory how much surcharge? Plus mandatory 25% surcharge plus how much says? Plus 4% says effectively how much? Effectively 78%. Now listen to one small examination tip which I am giving you. In the examination, will you talk about 60% or will you talk about 78%? You will talk about 60%. 60% plus 25% plus 4%. You have to show this. Your understanding. Because 7B step marks. You are getting it. You have to show this entire thing. Don't straight away write 78%. See, when can you use 78% number directly? Like let's say you are doing MCQ calculation. MCQ calculation, quickly you want answer. Nobody cares about presentation. There you use 78% number. Okay. But otherwise, descriptive answer when you are writing. There you show proper breakup. 60% tax, 25% surcharge. 4% is proper breakup you show okay then what about 115 bbj this is your net winnings from online games what's your tax rate here amazing 30 percent new section yes yes triple one a stcg tax rate is how much triple one a stcg 15 percent very good 112 a ltcg is how much tax rate 10 percent you remember uh, in 112 we tell me correctly up to how much of ltcg no tax up to how much of LTCG? No tax. Amazing, Shivani. 1 lakh. Up to 1 lakh. No tax. Any LTCG above 1 lakh? 10% tax. 10% of the excess, right? And 112 LTCG, how much is a tax? 
here the tax is generally 20%. But if your uh, asset happens to be listed securities or zero coupon bonds, then you have an option. Do you remember what the option is? Listed securities or zero coupon bonds without indexation, how much tax rate is applicable without indexation? 10% tax rate is applicable. Otherwise, generally the tax rate is 20%, but listed securities or zero coupon bonds without indexation, you have an option of paying 10% tax. Crystal clear till here, everybody. Yes, so these were the tax rates which are applicable to whom? These tax rates, guys, whatever I've discussed over here, this 115 BAC and all, does it apply to every SSE? No, it applies only to individuals, HUF, AOP, BOI, and AJP. Just for your information, earlier, uh, Finance Act 2022, if you see, 115 BAC was only for individual or HUF, okay? Now, when they made the change in Finance Act 2023, they are applying 115 BAC to AOP, BOI, AJP also. This might be a new learning for many of you. But I'm hoping everybody has grasped it once and for all. Done and dusted. Can I go to the next category of assessees? We are talking about tax rates. Under the tax rates, we have spoken about the tax rates applicable for individual HUF, AOP, BOY, and AJP. Now listen, partnership firms, no change in tax rates. The next change in tax rates is applicable for companies. See, do you agree that companies can be of two categories? Companies can either be foreign companies or companies can be Indian companies, right guys? Uh, just getting uh, a point straight to you all in the beginning of the session itself. See, what is my target through this session? Am I going to just talk to you about amendments alone? No, I'm not talking to you about just amendments. Connected to the amendment, points connected to the amendment, even that I want to do for you because even those will become important points. Just before the examination, if we are discussing amendments, I don't want to restrict myself just to the amendments. Interconnected concepts also I want to talk to you about, okay? So le letting, that, uh, letting you be aware of this in the beginning itself. Now tell me, foreign company, what's the tax rate? Tell me, come on everybody, foreign company tax rate is 40%, amazing. Indian company, if you see, Indian company, the most preferable section for Indian company is going to be section 115 BAB. If section 115 BAB is applicable to the company, then the tax rate is going to be 15% tax, plus how much surcharge, guys? Mandatory how much surcharge? Mandatory 10% surcharge, okay. If 115 BAB is not applicable to the SSE, then you will try to apply 115 BAA. If 115 BAA is applicable to the SSE, then 22% tax will apply plus again mandatory 10% surcharge. Okay. If both of these are not applicable, then you will come to the third scenario. You will look at the turnover of the company when two years back. Your examination previous year is 23-24. So what is two years back? Two years back is going to be preceding previous year 21-22, guys. 21-22, if the turnover is within dash, then dash percentage of tax. Could you help me fill in the blanks, please? Preceding previous year 21-22, if turnover is within... Ah, nice. Turnover is within 400 crores. Then what percentage of tax? 25% of tax. Very good. And for all other companies, what is going to be the tax rate, guys? All other companies, 30% is going to be the tax rate. See? Don't get confused. Just letting you guys know, 115 BAB and 115 BAA, some of you might be wondering, what is this section? Never heard of this. Just know that these two sections in full detail are only a part of your CA final. But at the intermediate level, if you look at your updated ICI study material, these tax rate numbers alone are there. So MCQ point of view, I just want you to be aware of the tax rates alone. But applicability of these two sections is not a part of your syllabus. You just need to know that 115 BAB 15% 15 tax, 115 BAA 22% tax. Now, did you understand why I put it in this sequence? See, obviously, which is going to be the most beneficial for the company? What will the company try to fall under? Of course, 15% is the least tax rate, right? So first, we will try to fit in over here. If we don't fit in into 115 BAB, then only we'll come to 115 BAA. If we don't fit in here, then we will look at two years back turnover. Is it within 400 crores? And only if even this is not applicable, only then we come to 30%. So please follow the sequence. First, you will try 115 BAB. If not applicable, 
applicable then 115 BAA if not applicable then two years back turnover you will see if even that is not applicable then only all other companies 30 percent is this also clear yes guys come on give me one quick response yes 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 tell me everybody please so with this we have spoken about the tax rates applicable for individual HUF AOP BOI AJP and company other assesses there is no change in the tax rate here what is the amendment tell me here the amendment is 21-22. Last year you must have learned about 2021 preceding previous year. Of course, now when it is now when I'm talking about uh, 21, uh, when I'm talking about 23-24 previous year applicable for your exam, we're talking about two years back. All right. So this is it about our discussion with respect to the default provisions applicable for individual HUF AOP BOI AJP as well as the company's discussion. Can you please answer my question now? Will section 115 BAC default provisions apply for companies also? No. Section 115 BAC applicable only for individual HUF, AOP, BOI, AJP. Okay. So with this, if you see, we are done learning with our first point, which is about the tax rates. Now, let me take you up through the debate discussion first, then we'll come to surcharge. Okay. So coming to the second amendment now, which is going to be about rebate. Rebate under which section, guys? Rebate under section 87A. Now here, uh, the amendment is not in the normal provisions. Amendment is in the default provisions. But still, it will be a good revision for you. Tell me, if you look at the normal provisions of the Act, if you look at the normal provisions, uh, what are the conditions if you want rebate? What is condition one? Who should your SSE be? Your SSE has to be an individual. And what kind of an individual, guys? He has to be a resident individual and third condition his total income has to be within how much total income has to be within 5 lakh rupees right if all these conditions are fulfilled then how much rebate do you give him under section 87a how much maximum rebate do you give him under section 87a the maximum rebate that you give him is going to be 12,500 so this is what you already know about under the normal provisions Right, guys. Now, uh, what about the default provisions? That is, what if your assessee is following section 115 BAC, then how will the rebate change? See, there is a very, very interesting discussion with respect to rebate under 115 BAC. See, I'm first copying the same thing as it is so that you can identify where exactly the changes. See, even over here, your assessee has to be only individual. Guys, did I make a mistake? Is 87 a rebate for HUF also? Come on, come on, tell me yes or no. Is 87 a rebate for HUF also? Come on. Ah, see, there's so much confusion in the chat box. This is a very popular doubt which students have. 87A rebate is only for individuals, guys, and not for HUS. It's only for individual. Very popular doubt which students have correctly in the examination in those three hours. All these doubts, our mind will start thinking about. Eliminate all these confusions now itself. Only for individual. Okay. Now tell me, under 115 BAC, individual resident, but total income, what will be the limit? Tell me, total income, the limit is going to be? 7 lakhs, right? Total income has to be within 7 lakhs. Then 87 year rebate maximum, how much will you give me? 87 year rebate maximum, 25,000 you will give me. Like a total double, exact double, right? 25,000 rebate you will give me. But are you aware that under 87A, in your default provisions, you have one more special point. If your total income is more than 7 lakhs, even in that case, sometimes you may get 87 year rebate. I'll straight away give you one example to help you understand. So under the default provisions, we will have two discussions with respect to rebate. We will have what we've discussed over here and we'll have another discussion also, which is nothing but relief connected to 87A rebate. See, this relief is something similar to what we do in marginal relief. In surcharge, we do marginal relief, no? Something similar we have over here. And this particular part, I have seen that students are, you know, trying to mug this up. So therefore, I'm not going to give you any formula over here. For this relief, I am going to give you pure logic to help you understand. That way, you will just not make a mistake in the examination. 
I'll straight away take an example. Let us say the income of your assessee, the total income of your assessee happens to be 7,15,000. Okay, this is the income, the total income of your assessee. Now, how will you compute tax guys? What's going to be your first step? First step, you will compute basic tax, right? Normal provisions or default provisions? What are we following? We are following the default provisions right now, isn't it? So step one, basic tax, if you have to compute, uh, how will you compute the basic tax? Tell me 7,15,000 is the total income. How will you compute basic tax? Come on, tell me. Up to 3 lakh, no tax. 3 lakh to 6 lakhs, in between 3 lakh income, 5% tax, how much? 15,000. So 15,000 plus, what's your income? 7,15,000 in excess of 6 lakh, what percentage? Tell me. What percentage? 10 percentage. Very good. See, don't get confused, guys. I simply applied this slab, don't you think? We have applied this slab. Our income is 7,15,000. It is in between this slab. So 15,000 plus 10 percent of our income in excess of 6 lakhs. That was, that's what I've done. 15,000 plus 10 percent of our income in excess of 6 lakhs. Could you quickly do the math? Tell me how much does it uh, work out to? Do you get this number, 26,500? Yes. Then after this step two, you will think about section 87A rebate. See, will I directly have 87A rebate over here? I will not have directly 87A rebate because my total income is more than 7 lakhs. Total income is more than 7 lakhs, so I will not directly have rebate. So instead of rebate, I will think about relief. Now you tell me, when do we get rebate? Only total income is within how much? Only total income is within 7 lakhs. So for a moment, I will assume that my assessee's total income is 7 lakhs. So if my assessee's total income is 7 lakhs, then in that case, what would be the basic tax for the assessee, guys? Same thing, basic tax would be 15,000 plus 10% of the assessee's income in excess of 6 lakhs. How much will this work out to? Come on, calculate. This is going to work out to 25,000, guys. And then, would you have given your assessee 87 a rebate? Yes, you would have given your assessee 87 a rebate because resident, individual, income is within 7 lakh, up to 7 lakh. So, you would give 87 a rebate. How much maximum 87 a rebate you would give? 25,000 you would give, guys, 87 a rebate. So, what would the net tax of this assessee be? If total income is 7 lakhs, net tax of this assessee would be? zero right now you tell me you tell me what is the actual total income of the assessee what is the actual total income of the assessee seven lakh fifteen thousand for seven lakh fifteen thousand income how much tax are you asking your assessee to pay how much tax you're asking your assessee to pay guys twenty six five hundred you're asking your assessee to pay right and what is the imaginary income of your assessee imaginary income imaginary income is 7 lakhs for 7 lakh imaginary income how much extra tax you're asking the assessee to pay zero so how much extra income has the assessee earned 15,000 extra income assessee has earned and for this how much extra tax are you asking the assessee to pay 26,500 extra tax you're asking him to pay is this fair is this fair? Just for 15,000 extra income, you're asking me to pay 26,500 extra tax. Not fair. So when the difference in income is less and difference in tax is high, this is where relief under section 87A will come into the picture. Now, what is the difference, guys? What is the difference? Tell me 26,500 minus 15,000. The difference is 11,500. This is what I will get as section 87A relief over here. You are understanding. So, if you see, my basic tax was how much? My basic tax was 26,500. I'll get relief of 11,500. So, what will be my net number now? If I have to create a summary now, if I have to create a summary, what is the basic tax we computed? 26,500. Less section 87A, how much relief I got? 11,500. So, what is my net number as of now? My net number as of now is going to be 15,000 rupees, no surcharge. So, we'll straight away add says at the rate of 4%, which is going to be 600 rupees. And then total is going to be 15,600 rupees. This much tax you have to pay. Understanding everybody? So, this was our discussion with respect to 87A relief. Now, I'll repeat once again very quickly. Listen to me. What I'm telling you over here, don't you think it is sounding very similar to marginal relief? 
Yes, Kavya, it's very, very similar to what you do under marginal relief. You, you're getting it. If you learn it with logic, it's actually just like what you do under marginal relief. All right. So what I did over here to help you understand relief is under section 115 BAC, if you look at your 87A rebate, you have two parts, two parts of the discussion. The first part here and the second part over here. The first part says if total income is within 7 lakh, then only I will give you 87A rebate, 25,000. But however, even if income is more than 7 lakh, even then you can have a relief. Now, how will you do this computation, guys? Like in my example, total income was 7,15,000. Now, this total income is more than 7 lakhs. So, which means 87 little bit directly you did not give me. So, because income is more than 7 lakh, I will think about this relief part. Income is more than 7 lakh. I will not fall under the first category, right? Because first category income has to be within 7 lakh. Here, my income is more than 7 lakh. I will not fall under the first category. Welcome to the second category. Now, in the second category, if you see our basic uh, in, in the second category we will not have 87 a rebate directly instead we will have a relief calculation my income is actually 7 lakh 15 thousand but i will assume what if my income is 7 lakh for 7 lakh income i computed tax it was zero then this calculation is just like what you do in marginal relief guys my income is 7 lakh 15 thousand for 7 lakh 15 thousand income how much tax you're asking me to pay 26,500 tax you're asking me to pay. But my imaginary income is 7 lakhs. For 7 lakh imaginary income, you were not asking me to pay any tax. So how much extra income I've earned? I've earned 15,000 extra income. How much extra tax you've asked me to pay? 26,500 extra tax you've asked me to pay. So difference in income is only 15,000. Just because I earned 15,000 extra income, you're asking me to pay 26,500 extra tax. That is not fair. So there Therefore, the difference between these two numbers, this will become my 87A number. Okay, so my basic tax was 26,500. Uh, Against this, I will enjoy this 87A relief of 11,500. This will be my balance tax. No surcharge, obviously. So says is going to be usual 4%. 15,600 is going to become a new number. Even this is a new insertion. Even this relief was not there earlier. Brought in newly by your Finance Act 2023 amendments. All right, now I'm hoping you got it. I've discussed the whole thing twice with you all. Now I'll take you to the next discussion. Everybody ready? Yes. So with this, we have completed our learning with respect to the tax rates and we have completed rebate under section 87A. Now let's go to our final discussion under our basic concepts chapter, which is going to be about surcharge. All right surcharge now when i talk about surcharge there is the amendment is the amendment for individual huf aop boy ajp or is amendment for everybody amendment is only for this category is there amendment only in the default provisions 115 bsc or is amendment both in normal and in 115 bsc the amendment is only in 115 BAC. So surcharge, if you see, your normal provisions surcharge is just the same. Surcharge under section 115 BAC, this is where there is a huge amendment. Surcharge under section 115 BAC, this is where you have the amendment. Are you understanding everybody? Our first learning was the tax rates under 115 BAC and the tax rate for companies. Our second discussion was 87A rebit under section 115 BAC. Our third learning is surcharge under section 115 BAC. What is the amendment over here? Is anybody aware of what is the amendment? The amendment over here is maximum surcharge rate. What is a maximum surcharge rate, guys? Maximum surcharge rate under the 115 BAC is going to be 25%. In the normal provisions, what is 115 BAC? Uh, in normal provisions, what is surcharge maximum? Surcharge maximum is 37%, right? But under 115 BAC, surcharge maximum will be 25%. Is it a good change or is it a bad change? What do you think? Good change or a bad change? This is definitely not good because see, when the company is, uh, when the government is reducing surcharge, surcharge is rich man's tax, no. Only when you have 50 lakhs income, 1 crore income, 10 crore income, only then you have surcharge. 
surcharge is rich man's tax we are reducing the rich man's tax good or bad it is bad the rich guy is going to be able to pay tax ask him to pay tax if government wants to ask anybody to pay lesser tax if government wants to reduce anybody's tax whose ka whose tax government should reduce the middle class understanding the middle class a low middle class reduce their tax if the government is reducing the tax applicable to the rich people that's not really a welcome change and that is why this particular amendment had brought in a lot of criticism also for the government okay anyways getting back to the paper uh, looking at the way your answers are in the chat box i am getting tempted to discuss surcharge with you as per the normal provisions also as per 115 bac also it will take us 2 minutes extra only but proper revision will happen so therefore let us discuss under normal provisions also surcharge and under 115 bac default provisions also let us discuss surcharge under both okay first can we focus on normal provisions 100% participation you are going to give me okay so tell me now listen to me just listen to me okay see when it comes to surcharge a lot of times students make a mistake and why is a mistake because there are multiple numbers and students directly try to jump to the conclusion that is why i always tell students that when it comes to surcharge please follow a certain sequence you understand sequence go step by step try to fit your case in the first step doesn't fit then go to the second step doesn't fit then go to the third step and so on don't immediately ever try to jump to conclusion always go step by step okay like for example what's the first step if the total income of the assessee is within 50 lakhs will you ask your assessee to pay any surcharge if total income is within 50 lakhs then there will be no surcharge at all right if your case does not fall under the first step only then you will come to the second step second step if the total income is more than 50 lakh but within 1 crore then tell me how much surcharge will you ask your assessee to pay more than 50 lakhs within 1 crore how much surcharge will you ask your assessee to pay you will ask your assessee to pay 10% surcharge guys 10% of what i'll give you two options 10% of income or 10% of income tax correctly tell me 10% of income or 10% of income tax Ten percent of income tax. Very good. Now listen. Ten percent of income tax. Then comes a third point. What if the total income is more than one crore but within two crore? Now we'll have to pay fifteen percent of income tax. Then what if the total income minus dividend income minus triple one A S T C G minus all ltcg if you look at this balance income if it is more than 2 crore but within 5 crore then what will be the surcharge rate 25% of income tax guys and then coming to the fifth bucket again i am looking at this balance total income minus dividend income minus triple one ftcg minus all ltcg if the balance is more than 5 crore then Thirty-seven percent of income tax, and the last category. If your assessee doesn't fall under any of the above situations, then what will be the surcharge rate? Then the surcharge rate is going to be fifteen percent, right, guys? And in these two categories, if you see in these two categories, on those three special incomes, on those three special incomes, what will be the surcharge rate? Those three special income surcharge rate will be fifteen percent of income tax, right? Till here, clear. this is your normal provisions here there is absolutely no change as usual what was existing earlier only i have written for you over here but what if your assessee is following 115 bac then what will change only one thing will change and that is no 37% criteria everything else will remain the same so which means even over here if total income is within 50 lakhs you will have to pay no surcharge total income is more than 50 lakh within 1 crore you will have to pay 10% of income tax more than 1 crore within 2 crore you will have to pay 15% of income tax even over here you will after this find the 
difference difference as in total income minus dividend income minus triple one a stcg minus all ltcg will find the balance if this balance is more than 2 crore how much surcharge 25 percent of income tax you'll have to pay a surcharge and on these three special incomes how much surcharge on these three special income same 15 percent of income tax will be a surcharge but no five crore number basically Anyways, anyways, more than 2 crore, if the balance more than 2 crore, any amount more than 2 crore, 25% of income tax, no 37% number. And lastly, if your case doesn't fall under any of the cases above, then you will have to pay 15% of income taxes surcharge. So the amendment here is under the default provisions. The amendment is only in the default provisions under 115 BAC. Here the maximum surcharge rate is 25%. You don't have the 37% surcharge under 115 BAC. Understanding everybody? Yes. So uh, there's a question in the chat box. If including dividend LTGS, uh, LTCG and triple one is more than 2 crore, you will fall under this category, you know? You will fall under this category then if including it is more than 2 crore, you will end up falling in under this category. So your surcharge is going to be 15%. See, I'll give you one simple example. You will understand. Okay. Listen to me carefully. Can I keep my example uh, restricted to the default provisions? My example is with respect to 115 BAC. Okay. Let us say my assessee is having uh, salary income computed salary income of let's say uh, 50 lakh rupees. My assessee has IFHP income of let us say uh, 60 lakh rupees and my assessee has let us say a uh, dividend income of 90 lakh rupees or let's say let's say 100 lakh rupees. All right guys. So what is the assessee's total income now? 50 plus 60, 110 plus 100, 210 lakhs. This is the total income of the SSE and let us say SSE is following 115 BAC. Okay, now I'm not asking you to compute tax. I'm not asking you to compute surcharge. I'm just asking you what is going to be the surcharge rate applicable to the SSE. My only question to you is what is going to be the surcharge rate applicable to the SSE? Try giving me an answer and then I will explain to you. Try giving me an answer. good answers very good guys see i'll help you understand now listen to me see my assessee's total income is 210 lakhs what did i tell you never jump to a conclusion go step by step tell me is total income within 50 lakhs no it is 210 lakhs is total income more than 50 lakh within 1 crore no it is 210 lakhs is it more than 1 crore within 2 crore no it is 210 lakhs then you will try to find the difference what's the total income tell me What's the total income? Tell me. Total income is 210 lakhs. 210 lakhs minus, do you have any dividend income? Yes, you have dividend income of 100 lakhs. So what is the balance? The balance is 110 lakhs, which is nothing but 1 crore 10 lakhs, 1.1 crores. Now tell me, is this balance more than 2 crore? No. Total income minus dividend minus triple 1 ASTCG minus all LTCG. You are left with only 110 lakh. Is 110 lakh more than 2 crore? No. So you will not fit here also. Butlin, did you understand? Yes, you will not fit under this category because you're, you, you should not look at just this number being more than 2 crore. You will have to look at the balance. The balance, if you see, the balance is only 1.1 crore, which is not more than 2 crore. Even this will not apply. So none of these cases are applicable. Therefore, your surcharge rate is going to be what? Your surcharge rate is going to be 15% of income tax. Now understood? Now I'm hoping you have the required clarity, everybody. Yes, with this you would have understood the significance of following the sequence. When you follow the sequence one by one, you will just not make a mistake. Never jump to the answer directly, go through the entire set of steps. Then in that case, you will ensure that you get yourself your perfect answer. You understood this part? Total income was 210 lakhs, guys. Minus dividend income of 100 lakhs. No triple one a STCG, no LTCG. Balance was 110 lakhs. It was within 2 crore, not more than 2 crore. So therefore, even this was not applicable for us. So that is why none of the cases applicable. We'll come to the fifth category. 15% of income tax will apply.
all right so this is it about our discussion with respect to surcharge also and uh, with this we come to an end to our discussion with respect to the first part but wait, wait, before I close, one more thing I want to discuss with you. This is for individual HUF, AOP, BOI and AJP. What if your assessee happens to be? What if your assessee happens to be a partnership firm or LLP? Then what is the surcharge rate? Come on, tell me quickly. We'll revise. No amendment. Let's quickly revise. That's all. Firm, partnership firm, LLP. Uh, two situations. Total income is up to one crore no surcharge total income is more than one crore how much surcharge tell me correctly tell me total income is more than one crore very good 12 percent 12 percent of income tax very good answers then answer my next point what if the assessee happens to be a company now company will be two categories again we will talk about domestic companies and we'll talk about foreign companies right the slabs are the, are the same, only the surcharge rates are going to vary. Totally three slabs, guys. First slab, total income up to 1 crore, no surcharge. Second slab, total income more than 1 crore but within 10 crore. Domestic company, how much surcharge? Correctly tell me. Domestic company, 7%, ah, 7% 7 of income tax. And foreign companies? Foreign companies? good two percent of income tax and what if the total income happens to be more than 10 crores for domestic companies how much for domestic companies ah, 12 percent of income tax and for foreign companies foreign companies five percent of income tax very good and the same rate which is applicable for domestic company is also applicable for cooperative societies earlier if you see for cooperative societies and firms it was the same rate. Now, cooperative society and domestic company surcharge rate is going to be exactly the same. All right. So, this is it about our entire discussion with respect to the basic concepts chapter. With this, I am hoping you are thorough with the three things. Three things we spoke about, guys. Number one was 115 BAC tax rates. See, 115 BAC, we have a lot more things to discuss. Like, for example, we have to discuss it is a default regime. We have to discuss that can we keep jumping uh, 115 BAC, normal provisions, normal provisions, default provisions, default provisions, normal provisions. Can we keep jumping like that? We have to discuss about that also. Then you know very well, if a SSE follows 115 BAC, so many benefits, I will not to give him that also we have to discuss all of that i'm going to be discussing with you in the last part of our discussion in this discussion in this first unit i have only spoken to you about the tax rates okay 115 bsc lot more things we have to discuss that we will take up towards the end can i close this discussion can i take you to the second discussion everybody the second unit yes come on everybody i am hoping you are listening carefully i am hoping you are trying to grasp it all as well as you can my second discussion with you is going to be about the salaries head. In the salaries head, what are the amendments? Listen carefully, whatever I'm going to tell you is definitely going to flash across your minds during the examination. Listen, salaries head, how many amendments do we have? We have totally three amendments here, guys. First of all, we have to talk about leap salary amendment. Then we have to talk about a contribution to Agnivir Corpus Fund. Agnivir Corpus Fund. And finally, we also have to talk about uh, RFA. So three amendments we have. This one contribution to Agnivir Corpus Fund. This I will straight away take for you in the chapter 6a discussion. So we are going to keep this pending. Our focus is going to be on the first and the third one for now. Our very first one being leave salary. All right. Our very first discussion being leave salary. Listen to me. One small change is it. I'll explain it to you. Listen, see, I'll put on the whole provision for you, then I'll show you where the changes. In case your assessee has received leave salary, what's the first thing you will think about, guys? The first thing that you will think about is when did your assessee receive leave salary? Did your assessee receive leave salary during service or did your assessee receive leave salary at the time of retirement? 
that's going to be your first learning that's going to be your first observation now correctly answer my question if leave salary is received during service then what will you do taxable or exempt gayatri bhuvanesh saying taxable what if government employee then also taxable very good it will be taxable for all employees it's going to be taxable if it is received during service it will be taxable for all employees but if leave salary is received at the time of retirement here you will check who is the employee is the employee a government employee or is the employee a non government employee right guys if the employee happens to be a government employee then tell me what would your answer be then you would say it is exempt fully exempt guys but however if your assessee is a non government employee then you will see how much leave salary you've received all right you'll see how much leave salary is received from that how much is exempt and the balance is going to be taxable if your assessee happens to be a non government employee you have to see how much leave salary is received out of which how much is exempt and balance is going to be taxable now the whole question is how do i calculate this exempt number tell me how many things are we going to calculate to find this exempt number how many things will you calculate guys you will calculate totally four things right what are the what is the first thing tell me the first thing first thing you will see earned leave earned leave into what earned leave into average monthly salary earned leave into average monthly salary what is earned leave earned leave is nothing but your uh, leave credit you also call it as leave credit you also call it as accumulated leave same thing only when you are calculating this earned leave tell me maximum how many days of leave are you allowed in a year maximum how many days of leave can you take in a year 30 days keep that in mind okay so earn leave into average monthly salary all right this is going to be your first calculation then your second calculation is going to be 10 into 10 into what 10 into same average monthly salary then tell me earlier what was the maximum exemption earlier earlier how much maximum exemption you could enjoy 3 lakhs right now the maximum exemption is how much now the maximum exemption is 25 lakhs see don't get confused what is the maximum exemption for gratuity if you're calculating for gratuity whether covered by poga whether not covered by poga what's the maximum uh, limit for gratuity for gratuity it is 20 lakhs okay and for leave salary it is 25 lakhs because lot of students have arrived at a conclusion oh leave salary gratuity same to same is it same to same no here it is 25 lakhs and here it is 20 lakhs in the entire lifetime of the assessee total maximum exemption assessee can claim is 25 lakh rupees and what's the final number the final number is actual leave salary so i've calculated four things out of the four things i will pick whichever is whichever is whichever is lesser whichever is lesser is what exempt or taxable whichever is lesser is exempt very good whichever is lesser is exempt received minus exempt the balance is going to be taxable so in leave salary what is the amendment guys only one small amendment you have and which is how much maximum exemption you will get 25 lakhs now i just want to spend a moment and discuss with you about average monthly salary also there is no amendment but i just want to discuss it with you just to give you a revision tell me average monthly salary how many months average will you find good 10 months average now 10 months before what 10 months before date of retirement or month of retirement 10 months before date of retirement perfect uh, if you are calculating for gratuity it will be 10 months before month of retirement for leave salary it will be 10 months before date of retirement i am hoping all these small small points i am hoping you are able to recall guys these small small points are what is going to differentiate your paper from the rest of the papers right so average monthly salary 10 months average 10 months before what 10 months before the date of retirement if it is gratuity you will calculate 10 months before month of retirement if it is leave salary 10 months before date of retirement finally tell me how many components how many components 
three components basic salary then da forming part of salary for retirement benefits and finally employees turnover based commission getting it guys so these are the three uh, these are the three things you'll calculate basic salary da forming part employees turnover based commission so these are the three things which you will enjoy uh, these are the three numbers which you will consider when you're calculating average monthly salary all right so 10 in, uh, so first earn leave into average monthly salary 10 into average monthly salary maximum exemption in the entire lifetime of the sse is 25 lakhs actual leave salary out of these four numbers you will pick whichever is the least and that's going to be your exemption received minus exempt balance is going to be taxable all right so this is how you will be doing your calculation when it comes to leave salary what is the amendment here the amendment is maximum exemption is going to be how much 25 lakhs all right now listen this was your first exemption under salary which was about leave salary, your first amendment. Now coming to the biggest and the most important amendment applicable to your May 2024 examination is RFA. Are we ready guys? RFA, I'm going to discuss with you the entire concept in full detail. We are going to be taking up the RFA discussion entirely. Everybody will sit up straight and listen to me as carefully as you can. Absolutely no background music in your mind. Listen to me attentively. See, listen, I'm going to draw the whole flowchart for you. Now, when it comes to RFA, what's the first thing you check? The first thing you check is who is your employee? Is your employee a government employee or is your employee a non-government employee? Right, guys, if your employee happens to be a government employee, I will have a very straightforward answer. I will simply pick which number. Come on, tell me. For government employees, which number do you pick? For government employees, you simply pick the license fee number, which will be directly given to you in the question. So government employees, license fee number is going to be taxable. Guys, taxable or exempt? It is perquisite. Perquisite to directly calculate the taxable number, license fee number will be taxable. If assess, if the employee happens to be a non-government employee, here what will you check? Tell me. If the employee happens to be a non-government employee, what will you check? You will check that is the accommodation, is the RFA owned by the employer or is the rent-free accommodation taken on lease by the employer okay see we should not use the word hire because the word hire is something that we use for movable goods like for example when i take a car i'll take a car on hire all right but when it is immovable property we use the word lease or we use the word rent we can also use the word rent but we should not use the word hire okay be careful about these small small things so now um, if it's a non-government employee i will check uh, is the rfa owned by the employer or has the employer himself uh, taken it on lease if it is owned by the employer then what will you look at guys you will look at the population of the place where the house is situated Tell me as per the old provision, then we will come to the amended provision. First, what are we talking about? The old provision. Okay. So, you will look at the population. Population as per which census, guys? You will look at population as per 2001 census, right? Old provision, you will look at population as per 2001 census. Tell me what are the slabs, please? If the population is more than 25 lakhs, then how will you calculate the taxable value? More than 25 lakhs, you will calculate it as 15% of salary right then what if the population is more than 10 lakhs but up to 25 lakhs then how will you calculate tell me then you will calculate 10 percent of salary very good guys and finally what if the population happens to be within 10 lakhs then what will you calculate then you will take 7.5 percent of salary now correctly tell me this 15 percent 10 percent 7.5 percent is what exempt or taxable Exempt or taxable, these are all taxable numbers, right guys? It is perquisite. I am directly going to calculate the taxable number. Had it been retirement benefit, I will calculate exempt number, received minus exempt, balance taxable. Had it been allowance, there also I will calculate exempt number. HRA for example, I calculate what is exempt, 
received minus exempt, balance is taxable. But when it comes to perquisites, we directly calculate the taxable number. So if the RFA is owned by the employer, I will look at the population. If the population as per 2001 census is more than 25 lakhs, then 15% of salary is taxable. More than 10 lakh up to 25 lakhs, 10% of salary is taxable. And if it is up to 10 lakhs, then 7.5% of salary is taxable. All right. Now the next part. What if the RFA is taken on lease by the employer? Then also does the population matter to you? Then population becomes irrelevant. You will straight away calculate two numbers. Tell me dash percentage of salary or lease rent paid by dash. Whichever is dash is dash. Fill in all the blanks. What percentage of salary? 15 percentage of salary or rent paid by whom? Rent paid by employer, whichever is what, whichever is, whichever is lesser is what, exempt or taxable, whichever is lesser is taxable. Perfect answers, guys. Yes, so this was my chart with respect to RFA, old provision. So if the assessee happens to be a government employee, straight away the license fee number is taxable. But if the assessee happens to be a non-government employee, then I will see the population as per 2001 census. Uh, if, if the house is owned by the employer, I will look at population as per 2001 census. More than 25 lakh, 15% of salary is taxable. More than 10 lakh, up to 25 lakhs, 10% of salary is taxable. Up to 10 lakh, 7.5% of salary is taxable. But however, if the house is taken on lease by the employer, then in that case, the population doesn't matter to me. Straight away, 15% of salary or rent paid by employer, whichever is lesser is taxable. I have discussed with you over here fully from the old provision point of view only. I haven't even spoken to you about the amendment yet. Now, before I go to the amendment, tell me one more thing. Salary, 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 salary. What do you mean by salary? Many components you have in the salary. What are all the components? Tell me all the components one by one. We will start with what? We'll start with basic salary, then which DA? DA forming part of retirement benefits, then commission, which commission will we take? Employees turnover based commission? No, we will take all commission, whether it is uh, turnover based or not turnover based doesn't matter. Then will we take uh, anything else? Yes, we will take bonus. We will also take uh, uh, fees. We will take bonus. We will take fees. Then we will also take any other taxable allowances and we will also include all other uh, non monet uh, all other taxable monetary payments all other taxable monetary payments taxable monetary payments means what taxable monetary payments any example can you give me of taxable monetary payment taxable monetary payment is any amount which you've received in money and it is taxable for you. Like for example, any leave salary which you have received during service, any leave salary received during service, it is money form guys and it is taxable. So taxable monetary payments, like for example, leave salary received during service, it is money, it is money form and it is taxable for you. All this also you will include. All right, guys. So basic salary plus DA forming part plus all commission plus bonus plus fees plus taxable allowances plus any other taxable monetary payments. All of this will be included under under salary. All right, guys. So this is our discussion about salary. So by doing all this calculation, what value will I get? What will I get? I will get the taxable value of what? Of unfurnished RFE. I'll get taxable value of unfurnished RFE. Now, if furniture is also given to me, what will we add? We will add the taxable value of furniture also, guys. Now, can you tell me how will I find the taxable value of furniture? It all depends upon does the employer own the furniture or has the employer himself taken the furniture on hire? If the employer owns the furniture, then how will you calculate? Then 10% per annum of the cost of the furniture. But if the employer himself has taken the furniture on hire, then you will take the higher charges paid by the employer. So for, uh, to the taxable value of unfurnished RFA, if you add the taxable value of furniture, what will you get? You will get the taxable value of furnished RFA, guys. 
then don't you think there is a possibility that any amount employee would have paid to the employer? There is a possibility that the employee would have paid some rent to the employer, some charges to the employer. We will subtract that and then tell me what will we get now? You answer my question, if the employee is paying some amount to the employer, if the employee is paying some amount to the employer, is it still rent free? For the employee, think from employee's point of view, if the employee is paying some rent to the employer, is it still rent free? No. So therefore, what will you call it? You can't call it rent free anymore. So what will you call it now? You will call it as accommodation at accommodation at concessional rent. That's all guys. This was our entire discussion as per old provision or new provision? Old provision. But do we still have to learn it? Even though it is old provision, do we still have to learn it? Yes. Yes, I'll tell you why. As I discuss, you will understand why. Now listen, uh, till here clear, right? Till here old provision only, nothing new. Now what I'm going to do is, I am going to copy the same thing as it is so that I can show you where exactly the difference is. The same thing I have copied, guys, as it is. So whatever I discussed with you here, this was the old provision. And what I'm going to discuss with you here, this is going to be my new provision. Listen to me, please. See. Tell me, in the new provision, where is the change? In the new provision, for government employee, any change? No. For non-government employee, any change? Yes. For non-government employee, if the RFA is owned by the employer, first of all, population as per which census? Population as per which census? Population as per 2011 census. Okay. Now the slabs itself will change, guys. If the population is more than how much? What is the biggest slab? If the population is more than 40 lakhs, then how? what percentage of salary? What's the highest number? 10% of salary. Then if the population is more than, instead of 10 lakhs, what will you have instead of 10 lakhs? If the population is more than 15 lakhs, but up to how much? Population is more than 15 lakh, but up to 40 lakhs. Then what will be your percentage? Tell me. What's the percentage? Very good. 7.5% of salary, guys. And what if the population... What if the population is uh, less than 15 lakhs, less than or equal to 15 lakhs? Then what percentage of salary? Then it's going to be 5% of salary. So these are the changes if the RFA is owned by employer. Any change in this part? Yes. If the RFA is taken on lease by the employer, then instead of 15% of salary, which number you will take? What's the highest number? Same highest number. 10% of salary. Everything else, everything else will stay the same. This is the only change. Whatever I have put in the different color over here, this is the only change, guys. Everything else remains the same. So tell me, without seeing, tell me, old provision. Everybody listen to me. Without seeing, tell me, old provision. Okay. If owned by the employer, then tell me, what are the population numbers? Just tell me the population numbers without seeing ones. 25 lakhs and 10 lakhs. Two population numbers, guys. What are the two population numbers? 25 lakhs and 10 lakhs. These are the two population numbers. And what is the percentage of, uh, what's the taxable value? What are the percentages you have? You have 15%, you have 10% and you have 7.5%. If taken on rent, which percentage do you talk about? 15 percentage you talk about. If you look at the new provision, if owned by the employer, what are the population numbers? Population numbers are 40 lakhs and 15 lakhs. And what are the percentages? The percentages are 10 percent, 7.5 percent and 5 percent. If taken on rent by the employer, then what number do you take? Then in that case, 15% number you take, uh, sorry, 10%, 10% number you take. One more difference, if owned by the employer, as per which census do you look at the population? Population you look at as per the 2001 census, right? And under the new provision, population you look at as per which census? Population you look as per uh, 2011 census. Okay, guys. 
Now listen, an extremely, extremely important point. The old provision will apply till when? The new provision will apply till when? From when? The new provision is applicable only for September 2023 onwards. Okay. Which means till 31st August, which provision was applicable? Till 31st August, 20, um, uh, the old provision was applicable. Now, the question arises that which of the two provisions do we have to follow? Do we have to follow them both? Do we have to learn them both? Yes, we have to learn them both, guys. Practically, what we do is that till 31st August 2023, April, May, June, July, August, for five months, we will apply the old provision. And for the remaining seven months, you will apply the new provision. So what you will do is you will split the year into two parts. You will split the year into five months and seven months. For the first five months, you will apply the old provision and the remaining seven months, you will apply the new provision. So do you have to learn both the provisions and go for the examination? Yes. You will have to learn them both and go till 31st August. We've done the old provision and from 1st September, we'll have to apply the new provision. Yes, guys, I see a lot of full course students attending the work, uh, attending the uh, amendments session today. I'm hoping you guys remember this is exactly what we did even in our uh, class as well, right? Till 31st August, you will apply the uh, old rules and for September 2023 onwards, you will apply the new provisions. Perfect clarity, everybody. Yes, so this was our entire discussion with respect to RFA. Can I ask you a few extra points now? Can I ask you a few extra questions? You try try if you're able to. Let's see if you're able to answer. Let, uh, let me give you one example. Answer my question. Example number one. Or let's say question number one. Uh, some extra questions, okay? Not connected to what we've discussed, but it's a part of RFA discussion. So you should know about it. See, what if the employer gave the employee RFA on the 1st of April itself? Okay, but the employee started utilizing the RFA, basically started occupying the RFA only June onwards. So therefore, you will calculate the taxable value from April onwards or from June onwards. You will calculate only June onwards and not April onwards. So you will calculate the taxable value only from the date on which the employee, uh, employee starts occupying the property. Okay, now listen to the second question. Question number two. The employer had given an RFA to the employee. Okay, the employee had done some gross misconduct, guys, because of which the employer had fired the employee. The employer had fired the employee. The employer had terminated the services of the employee. Let's say on 31st December 2023, he had terminated the services of the employee. Now tell me, can the employee still occupy the house? No, if he's not an employee, he shouldn't occupy the house. But guys, employee was not even vacating the house. Every day he would say, ah, okay, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. He was not even vacating the house. So what is my situation over here? The employee was fired on 31st December, but still the employee did not vacate the house. The employee vacated the house only in the month of March, let us say. Only on March 31st, he vacated the house. So now tell me, even now tell me, will the entire year, entire computation will it come to salary's head? No. Till 31st December, listen carefully, you will understand. Till 31st December, do you agree employer-employee relationship is there? Because employer-employee relationship is there, whatever is the taxable value of RFA, it will come to the salary's head, right? But for the months of Jan, Feb and March, the last three months tell me, do we have employer-employee relationship? Do we have employer-employee relationship? No. So can the taxable value come under the salary's head? No. Because you know very well, when does something come under the salary's head, guys? Only if there is employer-employee relationship. But Jan, Feb, March, no employer-employee relationship. So no salary's head. So obviously, where will it go to? It will go to the IFOS head. This is also clear. Yes, guys. So these were uh, two extra points which I wanted to discuss with you. So with this, we get done with our discussion with respect to our salaries adjustments. Now in salaries, yes, we have one more amendment which is relating to contribution to Agnivir Cor uh, Corpus Fund, which we will straight away discuss in our uh, chapter 6a. All right, guys, uh, HRA, there is no amendment. 
So this is it about our entire discussion with respect to salary. Under salary, we have two amendments, leave salary and RFA. Now I am taking you to our uh, next chapter, IFHP no amendment, coming to the PGBP chapter. Till here, whatever we've discussed, give me one quick confirmation. You've all understood all the amendments. Yes, basic concepts chapter. We had spoken about the default provisions, 115 BAC rates. We had spoken about marginal relief. Uh, no, no, not marginal relief. 87 A rebate we had spoken about and surcharge. And under salaries, two amendments we've spoken about, leave salary and RFA. I'm going to ask you five quick questions. You know, you know how a rapid fire round works in the quiz, right? Same way you're going to answer as quickly as you can, okay? Let's see five random questions I'm going to ask you. Okay, everybody. Try answering. Question number one. My assessee is a senior citizen. Under 115 BAC, what's going to be the basic exemption limit? Three lakhs only. What if my assessee is a super senior citizen? Then five lakhs? No. Very good. Then also same three lakh only. Under 115 BAC, the basic exemption limit does not change. Then answer my uh, second question. If assessees uh, two years back, preceding previous year, 21-22 turnover is within 400 crores and assessee is a domestic company, what's going to be the tax rate? Tax rate is going to be 25%. Very good. Then answer my third question. If my assessee is having some unexplained incomes, unexplained investments, what's going to be the effective tax rate? Listen to the question carefully. Effective tax rate. Effective tax rate will be 78%. Do you know the, do you know the breakup also? Yes, tell me 60% tax plus how much surcharge? 25% surcharge plus how much says? 4% says. Then answer my question. My third uh, third question or fourth third question. Answer my third question. 87 a rebate under 115 BSE. Maximum how much you can enjoy? 25,000. Very good. Answer my fourth question. Surcharge. In normal provision, surcharge, maximum surcharge rate is how much? Normal provisions. 37%. Very good. Under 115 BSE, what's the maximum surcharge rate possible? 25%. Perfect. Then answer one final question. One final question. Leave salary. What's the maximum exemption you can enjoy in your entire lifetime? You can enjoy 25 lakhs. And one bonus question, guys. One bonus question. Tell me RFA. RFA, what's the date which you will keep in your mind? From which date onwards new provision? 1st September 2023. So first five months old provision, seven months uh, uh, new provision. Okay. Can I take you to the next discussion now? Till you're confident? IFHP no amendment, guys. I'll take you now to uh, PGBP. All right. I'm taking you to our uh, PGBP discussion, which is going here. We have some uh, five uh, amendments we have. Here we will give enough time, guys, because all the five amendments extremely important. Okay. What are the five amendments? Listen to me. Our first amendment is with respect to section 28, clause 4. Our second amendment is with respect to preliminary expenses, preliminary expenses which is covered under section 35B. Our third amendment is with respect to section 43B, everybody's favorite, favorite section. The fourth amendment is with respect to section 44AD, presumptive taxation. And the fifth amendment is section 44AD, again, presumptive taxation. So this is what we're going to be talking about. Each of these five, you're going to be taking up one by one. And our first discussion is going to be about section 28, clause 4. Now, let me tell you what is section 28, clause 4. A very, very simple section, guys. Unnecessary students are uh, disturbed about this section. It's actually very basic. You answer my question. If uh, the employee gets any gift, if any gift employer gives to the employee, you will tax it under which head? You will tax it under the salary's head. No. Any gift if you receive relating to your business or profession. Any gift you get related to your business or profession, you will tax it under which head? Of course, PGPP head you will tax. All other gift you will tax under which head? All other gift you will tax under the IFOS head. Right. So we are right now focusing on this. If you get any gift relating to your business or profession, it will be taxed under PGBP head under section 28 clause 4. 
Only thing, we don't call it gift under 28 clause 4, we call it any benefit or perquisite. So if your assessee gets any benefit or perquisite, okay, listen carefully, I'm explaining 28 clause 4 to you. If assessee receives any benefit or perquisite, this benefit or perquisite is related to what guys? This benefit or perquisite is related to business or profession of the assessee. Assessee is getting some benefit or perquisite related to what? Related to business or profession of the assessee, all right, and this benefit or perquisite can be in cash also it can be in kind also if all these conditions are fulfilled then whatever is the value of this benefit it will be taxable for the assessee under the head pgbp it will be taxable under section 28 clause 4 it will be taxable that's all now what is the amendment over here the amendment over here is kind Earlier, we used to think that only cash benefits are covered over here, but now they've clarified that even benefits in kind will get covered over here. I am very sure part of this section would have gone right over your head. So, can we see some examples to get a little better clarity on this, please? Let's go a little deeper. I'll give you two examples, okay? Um, listen to my first example. Example number one. Uh, the example which I'm giving you right now, is very popular, especially in the stationary business. Like for example, let's say there is this person, Mr. Green, okay, and he uh, sells stationery. So let's say he's a stationery shopkeeper. All right. Now uh, he sells a lot of, um, I, uh, let's say classmate notebooks he sells. So classmate notebooks belong, uh, who manufactures ITC Limited guys? So ITC Limited gives him a target. What target? ITC Limited tells Mr. Green that if you are able to sell 5 lakh classmate notebooks in the month of let us say May 2024, then I will give you, I will gift you a free gold coin I will gift you understanding and let's say the stationary shopkeeper in the month of may 2024 his actual sale of classmate notebooks was six lakh classmate notebooks he sold so which means he met the target guys so now itc limited is going to give him this gold coin is going to give itc is going to give him now answer my question question number one do you agree for mr green this gold coin is benefit or perquisite it's a benefit. No, it's a benefit which Green has received. Do you agree? It is relating to his business or profession. He, stationery is his business. He sold classmate notebooks. Answer my question. Did the stationery shopkeeper do something out of the ordinary? Did he do something which is not a part of his usual business? Did he do something which is not a part of usual business? No, he did something which is a part of his day-to-day -day business guys and he got a benefit or a perquisite which is relating to his ben uh, to his business or profession and this is in kind so whatever is a value of this gold coin it will be taxable for mr green taxable under which head guys it will be taxable under the head of pgbp for mr green under section 28 clause 4 you understood. Similarly, many a times these uh, shopkeepers, they get free travel tickets. You meet this target. I'll give you a free sponsored uh, travel ticket to Dubai. So you might also get free travel tickets. Then there's a very good example given to us by Pranav. I'll read out his example. He says that a costly car was given to director Nelson for jailer. So even over here, if you see, the movie did so well that the producer had given the director a nice fancy car. So all of these examples, if you see, you're getting a benefit, you're getting a perquisite, you're getting some benefit in cash or in kind relating to your business or profession. All of this will be taxable for this person under section 28 clause 4 under the PGBP head. What is the amendment over here? The benefit is the amendment is that this benefit can be in cash or in kind. Guys, answer one question correctly. This 28 clause 4 is connected to which tedious section? Anybody? 28 clause 4 is connected to some tedious section, guys. Which one? Very good, Reshma. Section 194R. Even section 194R, if you receive any benefit or perquisite, more than what value? Do you remember? The value more than how much? More than? More than how much? 20,000. Very good. More than 20,000 rupees. What's a tedious rate? Tedious rate is 10%. Right? So just, just trying to interlink provisions for you. But anyways, I'm hoping 28 clause 4 you understood. 
under 28 clause 4 any benefit any perquisite you get related to your business or profession whether it is in cash or in kind it will be taxable for you under the head pgbp now i'll give you one more example the second example second example listen to me uh, carefully let us say hdfc bank hdfc bank uh, gave a loan of rupees 10 crores to reliance industries limited let us see now reliance industries limited is unable to repay the loan so hdfc bank gives a waiver to reliance industries limited a waiver of rupees 4 crores which means hdfc bank is saying 10 crore you have to repay you don't have 10 crore fine you don't have to repay 4 crore so repay how much how much will reliance repay to hdfc bank now reliance will repay the balance 6 crore alone the uh, alone reliance will repay now, do you agree, again, Reliance has enjoyed a benefit here? How much benefit they have enjoyed? Don't you think 4 crore is a benefit over here? They don't even have to repay the loan. 4 crore benefit they have enjoyed over here, which is again a big huge benefit for Reliance, guys. So this benefit of 4 crore rupees, do you agree? It is related to Reliance's business or profession. Yes, it is related to business or profession because this loan was for business or profession. So therefore, whatever is the value of this benefit, this 4 crore, this will be taxable for Reliance. It will be taxable under the head PGBP for Reliance. Under section 28 clause 4, it will be uh, taxable for Reliance. So whatever is the value of the benefit, whatever is the value of the perquisite, that's what's going to be taxable for Reliance. Now, in case you guys are unaware of section 194R very well, don't worry, we will anyways be doing a TDS revision on Monday. The uh, Calicut branch is arranging the TDS revision on Monday evening I will be doing. There anyways, we will be taking up all the TDS sections in full detail. So let's not get deviated right now. Okay, so we will anyways be taking it up over there, don't worry. So this is it about our discussion on the uh, first amendment on 28 clause 4. Can I take you now to the second amendment? Preliminary expenses, section 35D, guys. Come on. This one you all understood, no? Any benefit or perquisite you got related to your business or profession, whether in cash, whether in kind, it will be taxable for you under the head PGPP. Okay. Now, come on, guys. Come to the second amendment, which is relating to section 35D, preliminary expenses. Can I first... Put down for you the entire provision which was existing even earlier and then I'll show you where the amendment is. That's how you will understand it really really well. So listen carefully under section 35d preliminary expenses what does the section say? Listen to me. Section uh, see when I talk to you about preliminary expenses see what does preliminary expenses mean? with our already existing knowledge, we will say that before we set up any business, whatever expenses we incur, that is preliminary business, right? But under income tax, the meaning of preliminary expense is pretty wide. What do you mean by preliminary expense? It's a nice, huge, wide definition, guys. Section 35D, preliminary expense means either you could have incurred the expenditure before the commencement of business or you could have also incurred the expenditure after the commencement of business. How after the commencement of business possible? After commencement, either because you are extending your existing undertaking or because you are setting up a new unit you are setting up. I'll give you one simple example. Like for example, let's say I already have a paper manufacturing factory. Okay. And in the paper manufacturing factory, let's say I can manufacture 100 rolls of paper every day. Now I am trying to increase. I am trying to increase the capacity. And because of the increasing of capacity, I am now able to produce 150 rolls of paper every day. Don't you think I extended the capacity of my existing business? So for this, what I incurred, that may come under section 35D. Or I may have set up a new unit altogether. Even that will come under 
section 35d so under section 35d you could have incurred expenses when did you incur expenses guys either you incurred expenses before the commencement of business or you incurred the expenses after the commencement of business after commencement it can either be for extension of your existing unit or it can be because you want to set up a new unit okay so this was the first discussion that what do you mean by preliminary expenses now listen to the second point uh, who is the eligible assessee who can claim deduction under section 35d the assessee should either be an indian company if the assessee is a company the company has to be an indian company if the assessee happens to be any other non company like if the assessee happens to be individual huf aop boy and all we talking only about residents so if company assessee has to be an indian company if not the company any other person then has to be resident only then we will cover but irrespective of uh, you know which category assessee is falling under audit is mandatory assessee should be getting the audit done for sure audit is a precondition only then assessee will be eligible for section 35d deduction okay then comes our next discussion that what are the eligible expenses what are the expenses which the assessee is incurring listen the eligible expenses i will split them into two categories category 1 whatever expense assessee has incurred with respect to feasibility study if the assessee is doing some feasibility study let us say one second ah uh, the assessee is doing some feasibility uh, study let us say or if the assessee is doing some market survey let us say or or assessee is get uh, is getting some engineering services or let us say assessee is getting some uh, project report done so whatever expenses assessee is incurring to get all of this done one category let's say and in the second category let's say assessee happens to be a company so if the assessee is a company then we will have to incur incorporation expenses incorporation expenses we'll have to incur we'll have to pay the roc itself incorporation fees so incorporation expenses we'll have then we will have to incur legal charges to prepare our moa aoa we will need the services of either a company secretary or we will need the services of the uh, some lawyer because we have to prepare moa aoa or let us say we are incurring some public issue expenses the public issue expenses for example we are paying some underwriting commission or we are uh, making payment to prepare prospectus so all of these expenses can be incurred or let us say uh, the uh, so, so basically the company is incurring all of these expenses and why did i split them under two categories because the old provision was that whatever expenses are given in category a who should be doing this activity this activity should be done either by the assessee himself or it should be done by some approved concern and what is the category b activity category b activity can be done by any person either by the assessee or approved concern or unapproved concern doesn't matter anybody can be doing this activity all right now the amendment what is the amendment the amendment is that they have removed this so which means whether category a whether category b who is going to be doing the activity anybody can do the activity either the assessee can do this activity or some approved concern can do this activity or even an unapproved concern can do this activity it does not matter this is the first amendment under section 35d did you follow the first amendment is that earlier these four had to be done only by assessee or approved concern and these could be done by any person now they have eliminated this discrimination they are trying to simplify the section and now they are saying whether category a activities whether category b activities doesn't matter whether approved concern is doing unapproved concern is doing doesn't matter all of them all of these will get covered under section 35d this was the third point everybody i'll take you to the fourth point under section 35d the fourth point is that what is the maximum deduction that you will get there is a limit is there a maximum limit yes there is a maximum limit now how will you compute the maximum limit it depends is your assessee a company or is your assessee any other person if your assessee is a company you will calculate two numbers you will calculate what is the cost of uh, capital uh in the company you will see what is a no not cost of capital sorry cost of project what is the cost of project of the uh, uh, cost of project is nothing but what are all the 
fixed assets. How much fixed assets is a company having? And we will compare this with a capital employed. Uh, out of these two numbers, we will take whichever is the higher number and we will calculate 5% of that. This is going to be the maximum limit if the assessee happens to be a company. So this maximum limit we will compare with whatever you have actually incurred for preliminary expenses, your actual expense or this maximum limit, whichever is lesser. That's going to be a section 35D deduction, obviously, because this is a maximum limit. So cost of project, which is fixed assets or capital employed, whichever is higher out of these two numbers, you will pick. That's going to become your maximum deduction, your maximum limit. Now, listen, what do you mean by capital employed? Capital employed means, someone tell me, what do you mean by capital employed? Paid up share capital plus debentures plus long term borrowings. Could you please correct the mistake? There is a mistake which I purposely made in this. Can anybody try to identify what the mistake is? Amazing Varshini. I have only one correct answer. No, two correct answers. Varshini and Navneet. I have give, I have received two perfect answers. I am not supposed to take paid up share capital. I am supposed to take the issued share capital. See, generally, whenever we talk about capital, we talk about paid up share capital, right? But under section 35B, we are talking about issued share capital. Understood everybody? Yes. And what if the assessee happens to be any other assessee? If the assessee is any other assessee, then no capital employed. You will just take the cost of project and what percentage of this guys? 5% of this, this is going to be your maximum limit. So finally, what you will do is how much section 35D deduction are you going to get guys? How much reduction are you going to get? You will see what is your actual expenditure, all right? You will see how much have you actually incurred. Let's say actually we've incurred 5 lakh rupees, all right? And you will see what is a maximum deduction. On this basis, you will calculate the maximum deduction is, let us say, rupees uh, 4 lakh 50,000 rupees. So out of these two numbers, now tell me how much section 35D deduction you will get. I actually incurred 5 lakhs. The maximum limit is 4 lakh 50. So how much deduction I will get? Only 4 lakh 50 I will get. But across how many years? Across 5 years. So which means per annum 90,000, 90,000 I will get as a deduction. For 5 years I will get as a deduction. This is going to be my section 35D. Okay, and we have one final point under section 35D and that final point is that we have to prepare a statement. The assessee will have to furnish a statement. That statement should contain all the details of the preliminary expenses which the assessee has incurred and the statement has to be furnished by when. What will see? What will the statement contain? Statement will contain all the details of our preliminary expenses which we have incurred. But uh, when do we have to furnish this statement? We have to furnish it one month before ITR due date. So basically, we will see what is the ITR due date. Can you tell me ITR due date is mentioned under which section? ITR due date is mentioned under section 139 subsection 1. From this, we will minus one month. One month before this, this will be the last date by which this statement has to be furnished. Like for example, let's say the ITR due date applicable to the SSE is 31st October 2024. So minus one month will be what? Minus one month will be 30th September 2024. So by 30th September 2024, this statement has to be furnished. Statement containing what? Statement con containing details about the expenses which we have incurred under section 35D. This was our entire, entire discussion with respect to section 35D. What is the amendment? The first amendment is that we do not differentiate between approved concern and unapproved concern anymore. And the second uh, um, amendment is this statement, the statement which has to be furnished one month before our ITR due date. Crystal clear, everybody? Yes, so this is it about our entire, entire learning with respect to section 35D. Yes, guys. Understood. 
yes so this is it about our learning with respect to section 35b so what was our first amendment guys our first amendment was with respect to section 28 clause 4 come on everybody let's do one quick revision 28 clause 4 is nothing but benefits or perquisites any benefit or perquisite which you receive whether in cash or in kind related to business or profession will be taxed for you under which section under section 28 clause 4 and under which head under the head pgbp and then came our second provision which is with respect to section 35d Section 35D, we learnt it in five to six parts. Our first part over here was when are you incurring the expenses? When are you incurring the expenses? You're incurring the expenses either before the commencement of business or you're incurring the expenses after the commencement of business, either because you want to extend your existing unit or you want to establish a new unit. Who is the eligible SSE? If company, Indian company or any other resident SSE. But audit should be done. Eligible expenses, doesn't matter which category of expenses, doesn't matter whether approved concern, unapproved concern, doesn't matter. What's the maximum deduction? Will you tell me without seeing? For companies, how many things will you check for companies? Tell me. Come on, come on. How many things will you check for companies? Two things. Very good. What are the two things? Cost of project and capital employed. Cost of project means what? Your fixed asset number. Capital employed means what? Capital employed, how many things will you take? Three things you will take. What's the first one? Issued share capital. What's the second one? Second one. Uh, your uh, se second one is the ventures. And third one, long-term borrowings. Okay. Then answer my question. Co capital employed or cost of project, whichever is, whichever is very good. Whichever is higher, you will take. And what percentage of that? Five percentage of that. At five, uh, and what if my SSE is not a company? Then also, will you calculate capital employed cost of project? No, in that case, you will calculate only cost of project and 5% of that. These are going to be your maximum numbers. Now, you will see how much you actually incurred. You will compare it with the maximum number. On that basis, you will arrive at a section 35D deduction. And this 35D deduction, you will uh, enjoy across how many years? Across five years. Now, guys, one small deviation. But can you tell me where and all do you have five years criteria? Come on, tell me, where and all in your syllabus do you have five years criteria? Think, 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 come on. Let's give some exercise to our brain. Where and all do we have five years criteria? First, I have shown you over here section 35D. Where else? Very good. In IFHP, which concept? Pre-construction interest also you uh, uh, allow across five years. Then where else? Very good. Voluntary retirement scheme, even here you allow across five years. But do you remember voluntary retirement scheme only on payment basis, which means you actually have to pay the compensation only then we will allow for you across five years. Then where else? Any capex you which you have incurred with respect to family planning, even this will be allowed across five years. But tell me, expenses on promotion of family planning, is it allowed for all SSEs or is it allowed only for company SSEs? Expenses on promotion of family planning only for company. Keep that in mind. Anywhere else do you have five years criteria? Anywhere else? Five years criteria. Section 35D, we've spoken about IFHP pre-construction interest, VRS uh, payment basis, CapEx uh, family planning. Anywhere else five years criteria, that's it. That's all what I can think of right now. I think that's it. Five years criteria. Hmm. That's it. Section 35A, no, so 35 is BRS. We've already spoken about it. All right, guys. So this was just a small revision for you with respect to the uh, five years criteria. Why do I feel like we have one more place? Shivani, AMT is 15 years, not five years. How five years? 15 years, no. Right. All right. So this is it about our discussion with respect to Section 35D preliminary expenses. Now, can I take you to the most important discussion, the most important amendment? The first important amendment was RFA. And the second most important amendment will be Section 43B. Shall we begin? Yes, 43B, guys. Absolutely. 
no distraction no background music in your mind give me your 200% attention i am going to discuss the whole of section 43 b with you and then we will take up good number of examples also to understand better i am not just focusing on the amendment alone in section 43 b i want to discuss the entire section with you so sit up straight and give me as much participation as possible it is so obvious that slowly the enthusiasm is dying no guys be consistent you can't get tired so easily and already all right so sit up straight focus put in a little extra push yourselves a little bit more stay motivated keep sipping some water if you're feeling tired because now is not the time to be tired or to be sleepy you can sleep as much as you want after your exams are over feel all the tired you want to feel after your exams are over right now bring in some energy please and come on do this with me section 43 b extremely important you will thank yourself in those 3 hours if you pay attention to this discussion okay so in those 3 hours you do not want any regret at all in those 3 hours you don't want to be disappointed at all you want to let those 3 hours go as smooth as it take can see tell me what would you choose would you choose to relax today or would you choose 3 hours going smooth of course what are you going to choose Three hours going smooth, right? So whatever we have to put in to ensure those three hours go smooth, let's put in. It will be so worth it. Listen to this discussion. Trust me when I say this. You will enjoy the whole of section forty three B discussion. It's a very interesting section if learnt in the correct manner. Listen to me. We're starting with section forty three B. Now, do you agree that there are two heads of income where the method of accounting followed by the assessee is relevant? Which are the two heads of income, guys? Where the method of accounting which the assessee is following is relevant? Come on, tell me, guys. PGBP head and the IFOS head. Very good. Sai. Very good answer. PGBP head and IFOS head. In these two heads only, what method of accounting are you following is relevant. If you are following the accrual basis of accounting, which is also called as a mercantile basis of accounting, then in that case, uh, I will tax incomes when. When will I tax incomes? Tell me. I will tax incomes whenever you earn the income. And when will I consider expenses? I will consider expenses whenever you incur the expenses. What is the other method of accounting? accounting the other method of accounting is the cash basis of accounting in cash basis of accounting tell me when do we consider incomes when do we tax incomes we tax incomes only when we receive the income and when do we consider an expense we consider an expense only when we make payment of the expense right guys this was my first discussion with you now listen to the second discussion under section 43b section 43b will apply to which assessees section 43b is applicable only to those assessees who are following the accrual basis basis of accounting or assessees who are following the cash basis of accounting it will apply to only these assessees so which means if the assessee is following the cash basis of accounting can i say 43b is not applicable to the assessee do you agree yes so if the assessee is following cash basis of accounting section 43b is going to be not applicable to the assessee just been only when does 43b come into the picture 43b comes into the picture only when the assessee is following accrual basis of accounting till here also did you understand yes guys now listen to the third point under section 43b section 43b talks about a list of some expenses those specified i am going to call them as specified expenses what are those specified expenses we will understand those specified expenses when will we allow if your assessee has incurred these specified expenses accrual basis means when will you allow tell me when you incur the expenses itself you will allow but 43b says wait 43b says assessee you have incurred these specified expenses wait don't allow immediately wait first you go make payment payment has to be made within which due date payment has to be made within 139 one due date when are you filing your see you will have to see when are you actually filing the itr you will have to see what is 139 one due date out of these two whichever is earlier by the earlier out of these two dates assessee has to make payment 
what are the two dates guys number one what is the 139 one due date or when did assessee actually file the itr whichever is earlier by that date assessee has to make payment but assessee is saying no 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 i am following mercantile basis so whether payment made or not i don't care i incurred expenses i will allow the expenses what is 43b saying no assessee even if you are following mercantile basis i don't care even if you are following mercantile basis you first to go make payment of the expense only if you make payment of the expense only then i will allow assessee is asking when should i make payment 43b is saying listen assessee i am not saying make payment during the year itself to aram say make payment i am giving you time till 1391 till you file return till then you make payment if you make payment like that i will allow for you assessee is asking what is this 1391 due date can you tell me please how many 1391 due dates do you have three 1391 due dates you have guys your first 1391 due date is 31st november of the assessment year this is applicable to which assessees assessees who have specified domestic and international transactions transfer pricing assessees specified domestic and international transactions 30th november 30th november and then when is it 31st october 31st october will be for all companies for all assessees who have who have audit audit assessees 31st october all other assessees it is going to be 31st july of the assessment year right guys so these are the 139 one due dates by these two dates assessee you make the payment then i will allow assessee is asking what if i don't make payment within 139 one due date what will you do what will you say assessee if you don't take the payment within 139 one due date then we will disallow it for you we will disallow the expense for you assessee is asking will you disallow forever what will you say no assessee this is going to be a reversible disallowance reversible disallowance means what for now you did not make payment no for now we will disallow later whenever you make the payment in that year we will allow it again for you it is reversible disallowance like for example previous year 23 24 okay let us say 139 one due date was 31st october 2024 okay assessee did not make payment the payment was made by the assessee only on 1st of december 2024 only assessee made the payment so in 23 24 what will you do in 23 24 you will disallow do you agree because tell me did you make payment within 139 one due date no so therefore now you will disallow but when did you finally make the payment which year did you make the payment can you tell me which year is this when did you make the payment you made the payment in previous year 24 25 in 24 25 it will be allowed so are you noticing it is possible to reverse the disallowance this is a beauty of section 43b that this disallowance is not a permanent disallowance it is a reversible disallowance which means later whenever you make the payment in that year i will allow it once again for you perfect understanding everybody yes can i take you to the specified expenses can i discuss with you now what are the specified expenses yes guys now listen what are these specified expenses i'll discuss them with you one by one what are the points that we've learned already our first point was that the method of accounting is relevant for us only in pgbp and ifos now under pgbp 43b will apply only if the assessee is following accrual basis so under accrual basis generally as soon as you incur the expense you try to as soon as you incur the expense you allow the expense but 43b says even if you're following accrual basis you actually have to make payment of the expense within the 139 one date only then i will allow the expense for you if you don't make the payment within this date i will disallow it for you now later whenever you make the payment in that year i will allow it again for you all right now listen to me very carefully what are these specified expenses we are going to see these specified expenses one by one because section 43b is not applicable to each and every expense 43b is applicable only to some specified expenses now comes the first specified expense tax duty cess or fee second second employer's contribution see employer may be contributing towards gratuity fund towards recognized provident fund towards superannuation fund or any fund for the welfare of whom any fund for the welfare of employee then the third expense in case the employer is paying any bonus to employees or if the employer is paying any commission to employees or if the employer is paying any leave salary to employees all of this will get covered under section 43b which means assessee actually has to make payment within the 139 one date only then we will allow 
then we are talking about interest now interest to whom if the assessee has to pay any interest to public financial institution or state finance corporation or state industrial investment corporation or assessee has to pay any interest to some scheduled bank or assessee has to pay any interest to nbfc all of this will get covered under section 43b five people public financial institution state finance corporation state industrial investment corporation scheduled bank nbfc answer my question in this 43b if assessee has to pay interest to relative will you apply 43b no if partnership firm has to pay interest to partner will you apply section 43b no 43b will come into the picture only when assessee has to pay interest to these five people who are the five people one last time tell me public financial institution state finance corporation state industrial investment corporation scheduled bank nbfc interest payable to these people 43b will come come into the picture and finally if the assessee has to make payment to railways any sum which the assessee has to pay to the indian railway is probably because assessee used some railway assets so if the assessee has to pay any sum to the railways for using railway assets these seven points will come under section 43b now my focus right now is on this word fee what is this word fee tell me will this word fee include even lawyer fees will this word fee include even auditor fees what do you think yes or no will fee include lawyer fees auditor fees and all listen to me very carefully i will discuss with you right now how did the court interpret this word fee it will be a very good discussion for you because when concept from law will get revised for you now in law do you remember learning the interpretation of statutes chapter our favorite favorite chapter interpretation of statutes now under interpretation of statutes uh, do you remember learning the secondary rules of interpretation in secondary rules of interpretation do you remember learning this rule nauseter uh, sources do you remember learning this what does this rule say guys tell me this rule says if you want to understand the meaning of a word look at the associates of the word this word will derive color from the surrounding words look at the companions of the word that is what this rule says guys look at the associate words look at the companions of the word now tell me what is common between tax duty says tax duty says all the three we pay to whom all the three we pay to government so even fee i am talking about which fee only that fee which we pay to the government did you understand everybody so tell me will even lawyer fees get covered over here no will auditors fees get covered over here no you understood how we did the interpretation we applied nauseter sources nauseter sources says oh you want to understand the meaning of a word look at the surrounding words these are my surrounding words so these are all paid to the government so even fees which fees am i talking about only that fee which i pay to the government is this crystal clear everybody 43b knowledge also law knowledge also yes guys so whatever i have discussed with you till here is the existing provision i haven't even reached the amendment till now before i go to the amendment two small points left let's discuss them also then i'll take you to the amendment see listen i was supposed to pay interest i did not pay interest to these people so therefore i have unpaid interest unpaid interest is converted into loan does this amount to payment i have unpaid gst let us say unpaid gst is converted into loan does this amount to payment come on guys we've already learned all this tell me unpaid interest converted into loan this is not considered as payment but unpaid gst converted into loan this is considered as payment i hope you know this you also have a question in your icai study material on this point one illustration you have so same illustration only i'm talking about over here any unpaid interest converted into loan is not considered as payment but unpaid gst converted into loan is considered as payment can i close this discussion till here yes this was our existing provision i have covered the entire existing provision for you these are the seven expenses covered under 43b i am now taking you to the amendment guys this is where you give me your best all right till you very well you've grasped now listen to me 
the new point is with respect to micro and small enterprise. See, if my assessee has a payable, payable towards whom? Payable towards a micro enterprise or a payable towards small enterprise or a payable towards medium enterprise. Tell me which of the three should be excluded? Which of the three should I not consider? Medium enterprise. I am covering only micro and small enterprise. Tell me, does my assessee have to be micro or small enterprise? No. We are talking about what? We are talking about recipient being micro or small enterprise. Assessee can be whatever. I don't care. Assessee has a payable. Assessee has to pay money. To whom assessee has to pay money? To a micro enterprise or to a small enterprise. Now you will wonder. Like what is this micro enterprise? What is this small enterprise? Listen, micro enterprise is an enterprise whose investment in plant and machinery is within how much? Plant and machinery investment is within 1 crore and, and turnover is within how much? Turnover is within 5 crores. Then tell me, who is this small enterprise? Small enterprise is a person whose investment in plant and machinery is within how much? Within 10 crores. And turnover is within how much? Turnover is within 50 crores. All right, guys. So if assessee has a payable, the payable is towards whom? The payable is towards micro enterprise or small enterprise. Listen, assessee, you actually have to make payment. You have to make payment within which due date? You have to make the payment within section 15 time limit. Now payment should be within section 15 time limit. Now section 15 of which act? Is it section 15 of income tax act? No. We're talking about section 15 time limit. Section 15 time limit is given in which law? Section 15 time limit is given in micro small medium enterprises development act 2006 what is the name of the law micro small medium enterprises development act 2006 this law only gives you section 15 time limit now what is the section 15 time limit listen to me Till here, did you understand? Till here, what are we saying? We are saying that assessee, oh, you have a payable. You have to make payment to micro enterprise or small enterprise. You please make payment within section 15 time limit. Only if you make payment within section 15 time limit, then only, only if you make payment within section 15 time limit, only then it, the expense will be allowed for you. If you don't make the payment within section 15 time limit, then for now it's going to be disallowed for you. But again, the same thing, don't worry. This is a reversible disallowance, which means later when you make the payment in the year of payment, I will again allow it for you. Okay, now the burning question in front of us is, what is this section 15 time limit? By when should the payment be made? We are not talking about 139 one due date. If you're noticing in 43B, we generally talk about 139 one due date, right? But in this micro small enterprise discussion, we are not talking about 139 one due date. We are talking about section 15 time limit. Now, what is the section 15 time limit, guys? It all depends. Between the assessee and this party, between the assessee and the other party, is there a written agreement between them or is there no written agreement between them? See, if there is a written agreement, then in that case, we will see what is the time limit as per the written agreement. In the written agreement, what is the time limit given? Or we'll compare this with 45 days. So basically 45 days from when? When did the micro enterprise or the small enterprise deliver the goods to the SSE? Or when did they deliver the service to the SSE? When did the SSE accept the goods or services from this SSE? 45 days from that date. So either the payment has to be made within 45 days or whatever time limit is given as per the written agreement, whichever is what? Whichever is earlier. If there is no written agreement, then the payment has to be made within 15 days. We will see when did the assessee receive the goods, receive the services. From then within 15 days, the payment has to be made. So if there is a written agreement, then payment has to be made within whatever is the time limit as per the written agreement or 45 days, uh, whichever is earlier. Or if, the, if there is no written agreement, then the payment has to be made within 15 days. Okay. See, if the payment is made like this, within section 15 time limit, if the payment is made, then I will allow it for you. If the payment is not made as per section 15 time limit, for now, I will disallow it for you. But later, whenever you make the payment in that year, again, I will allow it for you. 
This is the only new amendment under section 43B, a very simple amendment, unnecessarily complicated by many of you all. This is it about the amendment under section 43B. Getting it? If a SSE has to make payment to whom? To a micro enterprise or to a small enterprise, a SSE, please make the payment within section 15 time limit. If you make the payment like that, I will allow it for you. If you don't make the payment, now I will disallow. Later, whenever you make the payment, in that year, I will allow it for you. What is section 15 time limit? Depends. Do we have a written agreement or do we not have a written agreement? If between the parties there is no written agreement, then 15 days time limit. If there is a written agreement, then see what is the time limit as per written agreement or 45 days, whichever is earlier. Okay, can we see some examples? Will you try answering my examples? Yes, listen to me. Look at this. First example over here. Apple purchases goods of 10,000 from A and Co, a micro enterprise. So we have one Mr. Apple, we have A and Co. A and Co is a micro enterprise. A and Co has sold goods to Apple. So do you agree that Apple has a payable? Apple has purchased goods. So of course they have to make payment now. Yes. Now, when did this entire transaction happen? They purchased goods on 1st of March 2024. Okay. Now, as per the written agreement between them, payment has to be made by 5th April. So, guys, listen. And the question says, Mr. A is following mercantile method of accounting. First of all, tell me, to this transaction, will Section 43B apply? Check. Check your conditions. Condition number one. Is your assessee following the mercantile basis of accounting, guys? Yes, assessee is following mercantile basis of accounting. Condition two, does the assessee have a payable, payable to a micro enterprise or to a small enterprise? Yes, assessee is having a payable. Then, uh, so, so which means both these conditions are fulfilled. So which means we can say that section 43B is applicable. Now section 43B says you'll have to look at section 15 time limit. Now section 15 time limit depends upon, is there a written agreement or not? Is there a written agreement, guys? Yes, there is a written agreement. So if there is a written agreement, two things we will calculate. What are the two things? Tell me. What's the first thing? The first thing is going to be as per the written agreement. As per the written agreement, what is the time limit? As per the written agreement, the time limit is 5th April 2024. And what is the second thing that we will check? The second thing we will check is 45 days. So when did the transaction happen? 1st March 2024 plus 45 days will be what? See, in March 30 days, exclude one 30 days then in the month of uh, april 15 days you will take you will get 45 days so first march plus 45 days will be what this is going to be 15th of april 2024 guys now out of these two dates which date you will have to pick whichever is earlier so which is earlier 5th april 2024 okay now in my question i am going to give you two situations Situation number one is that Assessi made the payment. Assessi made the payment when? In my first situation, Assessi made the payment on 2nd of April 2024. And the second question, Assessi made the payment, let's say, on 20th of April 2024. So first payment, 2nd of April 2024, is it okay? Is it within 5th April 2024? Yes. So when is it going to be allowed? Tell me. Will there be any disallowance? There's going to be no disallowance. Payment is made within section 15 time limit. So it's going to be fully allowed when in the current year 23-24 itself, it will be fully allowed because payment is made within section 15 time limit. So therefore, there is no question of disallowance. But if the payment is made on 20th April 2024, did you make the payment after 5th April 2024? Yes. So therefore, in 23-24, what will you do? You will disallow it. In the current year, in 23-24, you will disallow it. But tell me, when did you finally make the payment? You made the payment on 20th April 2024, which is which previous year? Which is previous year? 24-25. So in 24-25, it will be allowed. Now understood? Yes, so this was our entire discussion with respect to our first example. So first of all, my SSE had a payable with a micro or a small enterprise. SSE was following mercantile basis. 43B is applicable. Section 15 time limit we computed first. As I see, they have a written agreement. So as per the written agreement, it is 5th April 2024 or 45 days, whichever is earlier. 
So which is earlier, guys? Earlier is 5th April 2024. So was the payment made within 5th April 2024? On 2nd April 2024 is within 5th April 2024. So no disallowance. So current credit will be allowed. But if the payment is made on 20th April 2024, in simple words, if the payment is made after 5th April 2024, any time after 5th April 2024, if the payment is made, then for now we will disallow. But when is the payment made in that year, we will allow. This was our entire discussion with respect to our first example. Is this also crystal clear? Yes. Can I take you to one last example, everybody? Yes. One final, ex oh, not final example. I have two more examples for you. Listen to me. I'll bring the second example on your screen and I will give you time to arrive at the answer. Try this. I'll wait for you. Can we start discussing? Do we have answers? Yes. Let's check whether your answers are right or not. Listen to me. Point number one. X limited purchases raw material from Y limited. 640,000. Date of invoice is 1st February 2024. Date of acceptance is 1st February 2024. Which of the two dates is more relevant for us? The date of acceptance. Date of acceptance 1st February 2024. Y limited is a manufacturing company. Investment in plant and machinery is 3 crores. So tell me, is it a micro enterprise or a small enterprise? <clears throat> plant and machinery, 3 crores. Come on guys, this is going to be a small enterprise, right? We had discussed over here, see, plant and machinery up to 10 crore is going to be small enterprise. Only up to 1 crore is micro enterprise. So this is going to be a small enterprise. So we have two people in the story. We have Y limited and we have y, uh, X limited and Y limited. X Limited has purchased goods from Y Limited, let's say on the 1st of February 2024. Now X Limited has to make payment. They have a payable towards Y Limited and Y Limited happens to be a small enterprise. Okay. Generally, payment is made by X Limited within 30 days. However, there is no written agreement. There is no written agreement. Discuss in which previous year X Limited will be able to claim deduction if payment is made on several dates as shown below. 
So first of all, I will think about section 43B. But 43B, I will not straight away jump to 43B. Are my conditions fulfilled? Is 43B even applicable? Condition number one is the assessee following mercantile basis, guys. What do you think? The question does not say anything. But see, your assessee over here is X limited. Assessee is a company. In companies, act, accounts of companies chapter, you must have learned that can a company ever follow cash basis of accounting? Do you remember learning in accounts of companies chapter in law, we have learned that every company has to follow mercantile basis of accounting, has to follow double entry system of bookkeeping. So yes, of course, it is going to be mercantile basis only. It's a company. It can't be cash basis. First analysis clear. Then comes my second analysis. Condition number two, tell me, are we making a payment? Do we have a payable? Do we have a payable to a micro or a small enterprise? Yes, we have a payable towards a small enterprise. Both my conditions are fulfilled, which means 43B will apply, guys. Now, what does 43B say? 43B says make the payment within which time limit? Make the payment within section 15 time limit. Now, under 15, under section 15, what do we first check? Do we have a written agreement between the parties? No. So, if there is no written agreement, then what's going to be the time limit? The time limit is going to be 15 days. Now, when did we accept the goods? 1st February. So, 1st February 2024 plus 15 days is going to be what? This is going to be 16th of February 2024. So this is going to be my section 15 time limit. Everybody is crystal clear till here. Did you arrive at the same number? Section 15 time limit is going to be 16th February 2024. Now tell me in the first situation, we made the payment on 28th February 2024. Tell me, did we make the payment within 16th February 2024? No, we made a late payment. Clearly, we made a late payment. So, because we made a late payment, for now, I will disallow, guys. In previous year, 23-24, I will disallow. But when did I make the payment? Tell me. On 28 February 2024, which is again which year? I have made the payment in previous year, 23-24 itself. So, which means I will allow it again. So, first you are going to disallow and then you are going to allow. So, will there be any net impact about this transaction? No. You're understanding everybody. You made the payment on 28 February 2024. So first of all, do you agree you made a late payment? Your section 15 time limit is 16 February 2024, guys. You made payment on 28 February 2024. Of course, you've made a late payment. Now, because you made a late payment in the current year, I will disallow. But upon payment, I will allow. Payment you have made in the current year itself. You made the payment after section 15 time limit, but you've made the payment in the current year itself. Therefore, it will be allowed. So I will add back and then I will subtract again. So net impact will be zero only. I will first disallow and then I will allow again. So there will be no major impact because of section 43B in my first situation. Can I take you to the second situation? I'll first disallow and then I will allow. Why will I disallow? Because payment is made late. But however, payment is made within the year itself. So therefore, I will allow it once again. Then look at the second case. 31st March 2024. Did you make late payment, guys? Yes, you have made late payment. You were supposed to make the payment by 16th February. You made the payment on 31st March. Of course, you have made of course, you have made a late payment over here. No doubt about it. So under 23-24, in, in the current year 23-24, I will disallow. But when will I allow it again for you? I will allow it again whenever you make the payment. When did you make the payment? Same previous year 23-24 itself, you've made the payment. So again, same thing. In 23-24, I will disallow first because you made late payment. But because you've made the payment in the same year itself, upon payment, I will again allow it for you. So there will be no major impact because of 43B even over here. But what about the last case, guys? Even here, I have made late payment. So therefore, in previous year 23-24, I will disallow. But when did you finally make the payment? In which year did you make the payment? In previous year 24-25, you made the payment. That is when I will allow it. Vishnu is asking us, will 45 days time limit apply over here? What will your answer be, everybody? Will 45 days time limit apply here? No. Vishnu, when do I think about 45 days? Only if there is a written agreement. Only if there is a written agreement. Only then time limit as per written agreement or 45 days, whichever is earlier. In our case, no, no written agreement. So because no written agreement, only one time limit, which is 15 days time limit. Now understood, Vishnu? Yes, so that is it about this question. Can I take you to one final question, everybody? One final question. Yes, I'll show you the question. Look at this on your own as quickly as you can. Come on.
do we have answers can we start discussing see listen uh, we have a payable we have two conditions fulfilled mercantile basis and we have a payable to micro small enterprise so you will apply 43b 43b says make the payment within section 15 time limit now what is your section 15 time limit over here section 15 time limit is going to be uh, it, it depends upon do we have a written agreement or not so first of all tell me do we have a written agreement over here Yes, we do have a written agreement. So as per written agreement, the time limit is 30th April 2024. So 30th April 2024 or uh, 45 days. So 45 days is going to be 16th April. So which is which of the two is earlier? 16th April. This is going to be my section 15 time limit. Section 15 time limit, did you calculate correctly? Yes. Now tell me, was the first payment made within 16th April time limit, uh, within 16th April 2024? Yes. Was the payment made within 16th April 2024? Yes. So will there be any disallowance? There will be no disallowance. It will be fully allowed in the current year itself. Second payment, 6th April, this is also made within 16th April. So even over here, there will be no disallowance. It will be fully allowed. Then comes my third situation, 15th April 2024. Even this is made within 16th April. So even over here, there will be no disallowance. And finally, the last payment was made on 6th May 2024. This is paid beyond the section 15 time limit. So this 4,20,000, 4,20,000, this is the number that we will disallow. We will disallow in the current year 23-24 because payment is not made within section 15 time limit. But when is payment made, guys? In which year is the payment made? In previous year 24-25, the payment is made. So in 24-25, it will be allowed. With this, tell me, section 43 be done and dusted. Yes, guys, thorough with this now. Now there should be no scope of confusion left, especially the micro and small enterprise discussion. I think we've put in a 200%. If you're thorough with this, any question related to this, you will so easily be able to handle. Yes, guys, convinced. Can I close this discussion on section 43B? The whole of section 43B, top to bottom, we spent a good amount of time and we've completed it. I am so sure it's going to be so worth it for you. Can I take you to the last two sections under PGBP? Yes, we have only two more amendments under PGBP. Let's discuss them both one after the other. Come on, everybody. We're not giving up so soon. Let's go to the next adjustment, our fourth amendment, which is with respect to 44 AD. All right, everybody. Come on, sit up straight. No background music and listen to me. Section 44 AD. What is the section all about? This section is about presumptive taxation. Presumptive taxation of which assessees? Presumptive taxation of those assessees who are carrying on business. Okay. Let me discuss the whole section with you and then I'll tell you the exam the, the amendment. Condition number one. Under 44 AD, who is the assessee? Everybody tell me. Who is the assessee? Under 44 AD, the assessee has to be a resident individual or a resident HUF or a resident partnership firm. See, are you noticing? I'm specifically talking, talking about partnership firm, which means who the assessee should not be. Assessee should not be LLP. Assessee should not be company, AOP, BOI, AJP and all. We're talking only about individual HUF and partnership firm. Guys, listen to me carefully, everybody. See, 44 AD, 44 ADA, 44 A. these presumptive taxation sections come in the last part of your PGPP chapter, right? And what, what generally happens, listen to me, what generally happens, the student starts learning PGPP chapter with a lot of enthusiasm. But as you go concept after concept, you start feeling that the chapter is never ending. You start feeling that the chapter is endless. And then you get impatient and then you get irritated by the chapter. And by the time you reach the last few sections, the presumptive taxation sections, you just want to get done with the chapter. So don't you think most of you would have compromised nicely in these presumptive taxation sections? Because towards the end of the chapter, we just want to get done with the chapter. So even the faculty in the class, even students while revising these presumptive taxation sections get heavily compromised. And who knows this really well? 
the examiner knows this really well and the student would have compromised over here and correctly he will ask you a question from here only guys so these three sections your three presumptive taxation sections have to be your strongest sections under your pgpp chapter are you listening to me so therefore focus a little extra over here condition one assessee has to be resident individual huf or partnership firm not even llp individual huf or partnership firm condition number 2 this assessee must be carrying on a business but this business should not be the business of plying hiring or leasing goods carriages because here which section will apply instead here section 44 ae presumptive taxation will apply instead also assessee should not be in the in the agency business assessee should not be in the agency business uh, assessee can be in any other business except in plying hiring leasing goods carriages also should not be in the business of uh, should not be in agency business also the assessee should not be enjoying section 10 aa tax holiday also assessee should not be enjoying chapter 6a part c deductions okay then comes the third condition the third condition is that from this business what is the turnover of the assessee the turnover of the assessee has to be within 2 crores but however amendment time listen to me what is the amendment the amendment is that i will see what is the total cash receipts of the assessee are the cash receipts of the assessee within 5% of the total turnover of the assessee if the cash receipts of the assessee are within 5% of the total turnover of the assessee then in that case the third condition will change if the cash receipts are within 5% of the total turnover of the assessee then the turnover has to be within how much turnover has to be within 3 crores so generally the turnover has to be within 2 crore but if the cash receipts are within 5% of total turnover then the turnover should be within 3 crores answer my question everybody i have a question for you if assessee is having some receipts in bearer check will you call it as cash receipt or not will cash receipt include even bearer check surprisingly for the purpose of section 44 ad even bearer check will be considered as cash receipt yes guys it will be considered as cash receipt which means any check any check which is not an account pay check any check which is not an account pay check is also going to be considered as what as cash receipt are you understanding so the condition over here is that the cash uh, the, to the total cash receipts of the assessee have to be within 5% of the total turnover of the assessee now when you are calculating cash receipts you will not only consider actual cash receipts even bearer check receipt you will consider as if it is cash receipt so if the total cash receipt is within 5% of the total turnover then the limit will be 3 crore turnover should be within 3 crore then 44 ad will apply tell me guys how many conditions have i given you over here three conditions i have given you first condition assessee should be carrying assessee should be resident individual huf or partnership firm second condition assessee must be carrying on a business which should not be plying hiring leasing goods carriages should not be agency business also assessee should not be claiming 10 aa deduction or chapter 6a part c third condition turnover of the assessee has to be within 2 crore but if assessee's cash receipts are within 5% of the total turnover then the turnover limit is 3 crore turnover has to be within 3 crore i have three conditions if all these three conditions are fulfilled then assessee welcome to section 44 ad now what does section 44 ad say 44 ad says no allowances no disallowances depreciation section 35 section 35 ad nothing take and put in the dustbin no allowances no disallowances i will see what is the turnover of the business out of the turnover i will see how much is realized in dash mode on or before dash date could you help me fill in the blanks please i will see how much is realized within which in which mode how much is realized within uh, how much is realized in specified mode within which due date within section 139 one due date now whatever is this part of the turnover dash percentage is going to be pgbp what percentage tell me 
six percentage and whatever whatever is your balance turnover whether received not received when received in which mode received i don't care balance turnover what percentage will be your pgbp balance turnover eight percent will be pgbp no allowances no disallowances nothing you will straight away take six percent of pgbp in this category and eight percent of pgbp in the second category I'll repeat once again, like for example, let's say the turnover is 130 crores, the turnover, let us say, out of this 130 crores, let us say, uh, 40 lakhs of the turnover, oh wait, let me make one small correction, 130 lakhs was the turnover, out of it, let's say 40 lakhs was received by the assessee in cash, another 60 lakhs was uh, received by the assessee, let us say, in account pay check, okay? account pay check let's say it was received on 31st december 2023 another 10 lakhs was let us say received by the assessee again or the, this time it was received in electronic clearing system ecs electronic clearing system nothing but your neft imps rtgs and all this was received let's say on the 1st of november 2024 and the assessee is 1391 due date is let us say 31st July 2024. Okay, now with this information, could you please try to calculate and tell me what is going to be the PGBP of the SSE? How will you calculate? See, what's the total turnover of the SSE? Total turnover is 130 lakhs. Out of this 130 lakhs, can you tell me how much have I realized in specified mode within 139 one unit? Tell me, 40 lakhs in cash, is cash specified mode? No. 60 lakhs in account pay check, is account pay check specified mode? Yes. But is it within 139 one due date, guys? Did we receive the money within 139 one due date? Within 31st July 2024? Yes. So 60 lakhs I can consider. Can I consider this 10 lakhs number? Tell me yes or no. Yes or no? 10 lakhs number can I consider? ECS is specified mode. But did I receive within 139 one unit? Did I receive within 31st July 2024? No. So can I consider 10 lakh number? No. So how much is realized in specified mode guys? 60 lakhs. So 60 lakhs into 6% is how much? 60 lakhs into 6% 6, 6 this is going to be? 3 lakh 60,000. Now what's the balance turnover? Out of 130 lakh, we have spoken about 60 lakhs. So what is the balance turnover, guys? The balance turnover is 70 lakhs. Balance turnover doesn't matter whether received, whether not received, when received, in which more received, doesn't matter. Entire balance turnover, what percentage? 8 percentage. So 70 lakh into 8 percentage, it's going to be 5 lakh 60,000 rupees. So what's going to be the total PGBP of the SSE? Total 9 lakh 20,000 rupees. This is going to be the PGBP of the SSE. You understood. So section 44AD, we'll see how much of the turnover is realized in specified mode within 139 one due date, 6% of that turnover. Whatever is a balanced turnover, 8% of that, this is going to give me my PGBP number. All right. So under section 44AD, what is the amendment? The amendment is only this 3 crore number. Everything else is exactly the same. So under 44AD, condition number 1, assessee should be a resident individual HUF or partnership firm. Assessee should not be an LLP, company, AOP, BOY, AJP and all. Second condition, assessee must be carrying on a business, but that business should not be agency business. Business should not be applying, hiring, leasing of goods, carriages also. All right. Then after this, coming to the next point, um, assessee turnover should be within 2 crore. But if the cash received are within 5% of the total turnover, then turnover has to be within 3 crores. If all these three conditions are fulfilled, then we will uh, we will, we will apply 4480. Under 4480, no allowances, no disallowances. Under 4480, no allowances, no disallowances. You will simply see the turnover. If the turnover is realized within 139 bond unit in specified mode, 6% of the turnover, whatever is a balanced turnover, 8%. So this number is going to tell me, will this number impact this calculation? No, it will not impact this calculation. This 3 crore number is only to check your third condition. So you will simply see what is the cash receipt of the SSE. How much is the cash receipt of this SSE? Like for example, in this case, what was the cash receipt of the SSE? 40 lakhs. So 40 lakhs was a cash receipt of the SSE. And what's the total turnover of the SSE? 130 lakhs. So 40 lakhs by 130 lakh into 100. What is the percentage of cash receipt in this case, guys? 
40 lakhs divided by 130 lakh into 100. This is going to be 30.76%, which is more than 5%, guys. It is more than 5%, right? So in this case, if you see, are you listening? In this case, the cash receipts of the assessee are more than 5% of the total turnover of the company. So therefore, therefore, which limit will apply? Will 2 crore limit apply or 3 crore limit will apply? The 2 crore limit will apply. So uh, and 130 lakhs, if you see, is within 2 crore. So therefore, condition fulfilled. Okay, but if this number was, let us say, 3%, if this number was 3%, then you would say, oh, it is within 5%. If it is within 5%, then which number will apply? Then 3 crore number will apply. Then you will say, oh, 130 lakh is within 3 crore number. So therefore, yes, condition is fulfilled. Did you understand now? Yes. So if the turnover is within 3 crore, if the turnover, uh, so basically you see the cash receipt, if the cash receipt is within 5% of the total turnover, then the limit will become 3 crore. If the cash receipt is more than 5% of the total turnover, then the limit will be 2 crore. Okay. Now there's a question in the chat box. I'm going to read out the question. Shakti is asking us, if turnover is more than 3 crore, and cash receipt is within 5%, then what will happen? Can everybody try to answer? I'll repeat the question once again. The question is, what if the turnover is more than 3 crore and the cash receipts are within 5% of the total turnover, then what will happen? See, cash receipts are within 5%. So what will be the applicable limit? The applicable limit will be 3 crore. But turnover is more than 3 crore. So don't you think this condition itself will not get fulfilled, guys? If condition itself is not fulfilled, 44 AD itself will not apply. So if 44 AD, so in this case, 44 AD itself will not apply. If 44 AD is not applicable, the impact is that you will do the calculation as per normal provisions of the act. You cannot follow presumptive taxation. Perfect answers all of you have given. Very nice. Understood Shakti? Shakti and Arjuna Sundar? I'm hoping both of you have understood this. Yes, so this is it about 4480. But wait, before I close 4480, one more point I have to discuss with you. See, if section 44AD is applicable for you, then what are the benefits? If 44AD is applicable for you, what are the benefits? Benefit number one is that you don't have to maintain books of accounts under 44AA. Benefit number two, you don't have to get the books of accounts audited under 44AB. And benefit number three, advance tax you can pay in how many installments? See, if you have still have to pay advance tax. Full 100% advance tax you have to pay. But when will you pay advance tax? Only the last installment, only in the month of March you will pay. Full year you can enjoy the money. However, what if 44 AD is applicable for you, but still the assessee does not follow 44 AD? If 44 AD is applicable, but if you still don't follow 44 AD, then what will be the consequences? Tell me. In that case, you will have to mandatorily maintain books of accounts under 44 AA. You will have to mandatorily get them audited under 44 AB. Then advance tax, you will have to pay in all four installments and 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 there is one more consequence section 44ad subsection 4 listen to me let us say in year one you applied 44ad once you apply 44ad tell me how many years you have to continue to apply 44ad five next to five years next to five years you have to apply 44ad now, let us say in year 4, Assessi is not applying 44AD. Then what will happen? If Assessi does not follow 44AD in one of the next 5 years, then next 5 years, which is year 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, next 5 years, even if the Assessi wants, Assessi cannot follow 44AD. Right, guys? Once you follow 44AD, next to 5 years, you have to follow 44AD. Out of these next 5 years, one of the years, if you don't follow 44AD, then the remaining 5 years, even if you want to follow 44AD, the doors are closed for you. You can't follow 44AD. Crystal clear with this also? 
simple section guys yes this is it with our entire 44 ad discussion the amendment over here is that generally the limit is 2 crore but if the cash receipts are within 5% of the total turnover then the limit of turnover is going to be 3 crores can i close this discussion can i take you to our next section our final discussion under our pgbp Yes, guys, one final discussion under PGBP, which is going to be about section 44ADA. Listen to me, our fifth discussion, section 44ADA, even this is a presumptive taxation discussion, but presumptive taxation discussion applicable for which assessees? Those assessees which are carrying on professions. Okay, let me discuss this with you. What are the conditions over here? Condition number one is that the assessee has to be a resident, individual or partnership firm. Who is missing? Tell me. Who is missing? Who is missing? Come on, come on, everybody quick. Who is missing? HUF. In 44 AD, we spoke about HUF. Here, assessee should not be LLP, should not be HUF, should also not be company, AOP, BOY, AJP and all. Only resident individual and partnership firm only I am covering. Not even LLP I am covering, not even HUF I am covering. Condition number two, this assessee must be carrying on profession. But tell me, am I covering all professions? No, I am covering only specified profession. Assessee must be carrying on specified profession. Specified profession means where is it specified? Specified profession means it is specified under section 44AA. Like for example, you have doctor, engineer, uh, chartered accountant, company secretary, IT, uh, IT professionals, uh, representatives. You have all these film artists like actors, actresses, producers, directors, screenwriters, cameramen, um, uh, the script writers, the music directors. So all of these are your specified professionals. So assessee should be a specified profession. And the third and the final condition is that this assessee's gross receipt should be how much? The gross receipt has to be within 50 lakhs. Now comes the amendment. Tell me guys, if the cash receipt is within how much? Same thing, cash receipt is within Perfect. Within 5% of what? Within 5% of total receipts. If the cash receipt is within 5% of total receipts, then in that case, a gross receipt has to be within how much? Then the gross receipt has to be within 75 lakhs. This is the amendment in section 44 ADA. The generally, the limit is 50 lakhs. But if the cash receipts are within 5% of the total receipts, then the gross receipt should be within 75 lakhs. Even over here, tell me, if I'm having a receipt in bed, or check you will consider as cash receipt or not yes even bearer check will be considered as cash receipt basically anything which is not an account pay check will be considered as cash receipt three conditions guys if all my three conditions are fulfilled then assessee welcome to section 44 ADA. Now tell me under section 44 ADA, what is going to be the PGBP of the SSE? Very simple. I will simply take 50% of the gross receipts number. That will be the PGBP of the SSE. Very simple, much simpler than section 44 AD. Now tell me, what if my assessee follows 44 ADA? What will be the benefits for the assessee under section 44 ADA? Same benefits, guys. Assessee does not have to maintain books of accounts. Assessee does not have to get the books of accounts audited. Advanced tax assessee will still have to pay, but advanced tax assessee can pay only in the last installment. But however, what if 44 ADA is applicable for the assessee, but still the assessee does not want to follow 44 ADA? Then in that case, what will be the consequences applicable on the assessee? Same consequence, guys. In that case, assessee will have to mandatorily maintain books of accounts, mandatorily get them audited, advance tax all four installments. Tell me, even in 44 ADA, do you have a rule that once 44 ADA is applicable, you have to continue to apply 44 ADA for five years? Do you have that same rule even in section 44 ADA? And the answer is no. In, in 44 AD, you don't have that rule. Which rule? You understood which rule I'm talking about? This rule. In 44 AD, we have the rule, no, that once you apply 44 AD, next to five years, you have to follow. If you don't follow next to five years, one year, if you don't follow, then five years after that, even if you want to follow 44 AD, you can't follow. That rule you don't have in 44 AD. 
Understood? So 44 AD, 44 AD, a small, small amendment only. And that is, if the cash receipt is within 5%, then the limit is changing. Only the limit is changing. The calculation of PGPP will still be the same only. Are over this also, guys? Yes. Now tell me, in 44 AE, is there an amendment? In 44A, there is no amendment, but can we still discuss about it? With that, all your three presumptive taxation sections will get covered, guys. Because it will take us only three, four minutes. I think it will be worth it. Let's discuss 44AE also. No amendment in 44A, just extra discussion just to finish our presumptive taxation learning. Okay, so sixth concept, I'm talking about section 44AE. Even this is presumptive taxation. But presumptive taxation for which assessees? Those assessees who are in the business of plying, hiring, leasing, goods, carriages. Okay. Now here, first condition, who is the assessee? You tell me, who was the assessee in 44AD? Resident individual or HUF or partnership firm. Who was the assessee in 44ADA? 44ADA individual or partnership firm in 44a the assessee can be any assessee guys can the assessee be company also yes assessee can be company also assessee can be any assessee even a company only the only thing is that what business should this assessee be carrying on he should be carrying on the business of plying hiring leasing goods carriages maximum how many goods carriages he should have maximum how many goods carriages he should have maximum only 10 goods carriages he should have at any point of time it should not exceed 10 goods carriages during the year at any point of time it should not exceed 10 goods carriages i have three conditions if all these conditions are fulfilled then section 44 a e will apply now what does 44 a e say 44 a e how will we compute the pgpp guys we will see how many heavy vehicles we have heavy vehicles means what heavy vehicles means they can carry more than 12000 kg they can carry more than 12000 kg they can carry they'll become heavy vehicles heavy vehicles how do you calculate thousand rupees per ton per vehicle per month but month even part thereof you will consider i'm hoping you know that thousand rupees per ton per vehicle per month per month or part thereof even a part of the month you will fully consider in case you have any other vehicle, any other vehicle means what? It can carry up to 12,000 kg. Then how will you calculate 7,500 rupees per vehicle per month or part thereof? Okay. Now on this basis, whatever PGBP number you get, okay, whatever number you get, what is that one allowance which you will get from this? See, in section 44AD, if you see, this 6% number, 8% number, this is only your PGBP, no allowance, no disallowance. In 44ADA, this 50% is your PGBP, no allowance, no disallowance. But in 44A, after this one allowance you get, guys, which allowance? Section 40B allowance you get. This is going to be your taxable PGBP. Now, can you tell me what is this 40B allowance? What is 40B allowance? For 40B, who is the assessee? Correctly tell me. 40B, who is the assessee? Partnership firm or partner? Partnership firm is the assessee. So, partnership firm, whatever interest they pay to the partners, whatever salary is allowable, interest, remember, 12% per annum. Salary, remember, up to 3 lakh book profit, beyond 3 lakh book profit, 90%, 60%, 1 lakh 50,000. So, that interest and salary, that is under 40B. That alone is going to be allowed. You got it, guys? Do you have this allowance in 44AD and 44ADA also? No, we have this allowance only in 44A. With this, we are done with major, major amendments. We have learned about amendments starting from where? We began with our basic concepts discussion. Then we spoke about the amendments which are in your salaries chapter. And then we've spoken about the PGPP chapter also. Major big amendments we have completed. RFA and 43B was really, really important. And these two, I think we've done really, really well. All right. So coming to our next discussion now, which is going to be from the capital gains head. 
Now, in the capital gains head, let me tell you what are the points I have to discuss with you about. And then I'll start the discussions one by one. First of all, I have to tell you about some exclusions. There are some exclusions from capital gains, some sections which have been removed from your syllabus. Then we have to talk about the cost inflation index, which is applicable for the current year. Then we have a small discussion with respect to <clears throat> intangible assets. Then we have to discuss about another small point with respect to housing loan interest. Then we have to discuss about something called as electronic gold receipts. Not a very important amendment, but because there is an amendment, we will talk about it. And similarly, another not so important amendment is market linked debentures. Market linked debentures, electronic gold receipt, not very important. Then we have an amendment in section 54. And finally, we have an amendment in section 54F. Totally, eight things we have to talk about. Let's talk about them one by one. First of all, talking about the exclusion, there is something which is not a part of your syllabus anymore. See, earlier in our syllabus, we used to talk about section 45, 5A. Do you remember learning it? Those of you who have written the November 2023 examination, you must have learned about section 45, 5A, the section which talks about joint development agreements, specified, we call it specified agreements, specified agreements, joint development agreements. Are you able to recall? Yes, that concept is not a part of your syllabus anymore. It has been excluded. It's not a part of your syllabus anymore. Then talking about the cost inflation index, which is applicable for the year 23-24. For 23-24, the cost inflation index is 348. So these are your first two very simple points. The 45-5 is not a part of your syllabus anymore. And cost inflation index applicable for 23-24 is 348. Now let's talk about the new point with respect to intangible assets. We listen carefully if your asset happens to be an intangible asset and if this intangible asset happens to be a self-generated intangible asset. See earlier the rule, I'll tell you what was the rule earlier. <clears throat> earlier if the asset is a specified self-generated asset like we had a list of specified self-generated assets like goodwill or uh, trademark brand name like that we had a list of specified self-generated assets for those self-generated specified assets only the cost of acquisition was zero for the other assets we used to apply the Srinivasa Shetty case guys but however as per the amendment now any intangible asset you see if it is self-generated the cost of acquisition is zero so now if you see no concept of specified intangible not specified intangible that concept itself is not there anymore whether it is specified or not specified intangible any intangible asset if self-generated the cost of acquisition will be zero this is our third discussion guys so first discussion was about the exclusion second was about cost inflation index third was about intangible asset any self-generated intangible asset what's the cost of acquisition everybody zero okay now listen to the uh, fourth discussion. Your fourth discussion is with respect to housing loan interest. See, the question is, let us say I have a residential house property, okay? Or let's say any, any kind of a house property, if I have, uh, can we add the housing loan interest to the cost of acquisition? See, if the housing loan interest, if you have already claimed section 24 deduction in IFHP, or if you have already claimed section 80 double E or section 80 double E A deduction, if you have already claimed in chapter 6 A, then to this extent, this housing loan interest should not form a part of your cost of acquisition or cost of improvement as the case may be. Earlier, uh, people were, whatever housing loan interest they were paying, they were adding it to the cost of acquisition of the house. So that is what they've clarified now. If the housing loan interest, if you've already claimed as a deduction in section 24, section 80 EE or 80 EE, then the same housing loan interest, again, you can't add in your cost of acquisition, cost of improvement. We will not allow that. This is also simple. Then coming to our fifth amendment in our capital gains. This is with respect to electronic gold receipts. Electronic gold receipts. I'll help you understand this. Listen carefully. Uh, not very important, but still just be aware of it just because it's an amendment. Uh, what happens here is, is that, let's say I, uh, let, let's say this person, Mr. Blue. Okay. This person, Mr. Blue, he has physical gold, guys. Now, don't you think if I'm going to have physical gold, it will be a little inconvenient for me because one big problem I will have, the problem in the form of safety of the gold. I have some gold with me, but I will have a big problem also because I'll have to keep this gold carefully. So, I have a problem with respect to the safety of this gold. 
right guys so that is where this concept of electronic gold receipt comes into the picture this mr blue will go to a vault manager okay and he will give to this vault manager whatever physical gold he has he'll give to the vault manager the vault manager will keep the physical gold and against the physical gold the vault manager will give mr blue electronic gold receipt so whatever is the value of this physical gold for that value the vault manager will give mr blue electronic gold receipt you understood so do you agree that this electronic gold receipt will derive value from physical gold see on its own it will not have value because this electronic gold receipt was issued by the vault manager against the physical gold so do you agree if i don't deposit physical gold i will not get electronic gold receipt electronic gold receipt vault manager will give me only against physical gold okay so don't you think one transaction has already happened over here the transaction of conversion the transaction of conversion what did i convert i converted physical gold into what i have converted physical gold into electronic gold receipt always remember this conversion of physical gold into electronic gold receipt tell me will this amount to transfer conversion of physical gold into electronic gold receipt this is not considered as transfer so if there is no transfer do you agree at this stage no capital gains obviously right if i'm going to convert physical gold into electronic gold receipt at this stage there will be no transfer this is my first transaction guys now tell me what does blue have in his hands blue has in his hands electronic gold receipt now let us say mr blue sold this electronic gold receipt to this person mr green and in return let's say mr green would have paid some consideration to mr blue now don't you think uh, there is going to be capital gains in the hands of mr blue in the hands of mr blue he is going to have capital gains now let us say he had bought this physical gold this physical gold which he had no this physical gold the date of acquisition of the physical gold was 1st october 2010 let us say and he had converted this physical gold into electronic gold receipt on the 1st of april 2023 let us say and he sold this egr to mr green on the 1st of august 2023 let us say so when you are computing capital gains you need period of holding right so what is the period of holding see mr green has sold egr on 1st august so what is the capital asset the capital asset is egr but what will the period of holding be the period of holding will not start from egr date the period of holding will also include the period when we had the physical gold so the period of holding will start on 1st october 2010 and it will go on till when did we sell the egr 1st august 2023 first concept did you want no second concept did you understand the first concept is conversion of physical gold into egr does not amount to transfer the second concept is in case mr blue sells away the egr to mr green there will be capital gains the period of holding will also include the period during which i held the physical gold then what will be the cost of acquisition guys you tell me did mr blue pay anything to get the egr no he did not pay anything to get the egr so what will be his cost of acquisition whatever is the cost of acquisition of the physical gold to buy the physical gold whatever he had incurred long back at that time that will become his cost of acquisition till here also did you understand yes everybody till here crystal clear now let's think from green's point of view tell me what is green have in his hands green has in his hands egr now don't you think there is a possibility that green might want to convert this egr into physical gold so what will green do green will now come to whom green will now come to the vault manager and he will give the vault manager the egr that he has and what will the vault manager return to green vault manager will return physical gold to green so what happened over here guys again there is a conversion are you noticing again there is a conversion egr is getting converted into physical gold tell me conversion of egr into physical gold will it amount to transfer egr converted into physical gold will not amount to transfer is this clear everybody egr converted into physical gold will not amount to transfer 
then answer my question what does green have in his hands now gold when green later let's say mr green he sells away this gold let's say he sells this gold he has physical gold in his hands right he sells his gold to this person mr red let us say so when he sells gold again in the hands of green there will be capital gains right now period of holding will start when see first green had acquired what first he had acquired egr so period of holding will start when he had acquired the egr on 1st august 2023 and when did he convert the egr into physical gold let's say he converted the egr into physical gold on 1st december 2023 so the period of and let's say he sold the physical gold to mr red on the 1st of jan 2024 so his period of holding will start from the date his period of holding will start from the date on which he had acquired the egr and it will go on till the date on which he sold away the gold 1st jan 2024 for him his cost of acquisition will be the cost which he had spent to buy the egr it is pure logic guys if you remember that conversion is not amounting to transfer everything else will automatically fall into place okay so so physical gold when i convert into egr that conversion does not amount to transfer later when i sell away the egr the the period of holding will also include the period when i held the physical gold okay then mr what did green buy green bought egr that egr he is converting into physical gold this conversion will not amount to transfer later when he sells away the physical gold the period of holding will also include the period when he held the egr the cost of acquisition will be the cost which he had incurred to acquire the egr simple concept this is about electronic gold received then comes our next discussion our sixth discussion which is with respect to market linked debentures see uh, market linked debentures even this i don't think it is extremely i don't think it is very important at the intermediate level so listen we will not spend too much time over here see uh, there are two the two, two to three things over here what are we talking about number one we are talking about market linked debentures now what are these market linked debentures see don't you think generally in debentures what is the return guys in debentures for the investor what is the return for the debenture uh, for, for the investor the return is in the form of interest do you agree isn't it the return is in the form of interest right now um, what if the uh, return uh, depends upon the market returns basically if the market is doing well i'll give you higher interest or if the market is not doing great interest will be lower these are called as market linked debentures so market linked debentures are those debentures where the return that is the interest depends upon the market if the market is doing great you'll get high interest if market is not doing so great you'll get a lower interest so the market linked debentures are those debentures which depend upon the the whether return depends upon the market returns and then i am also talking about units of specified mutual fund i am talking about market linked debentures and units of specified mutual funds now what are these units of specified mutual fund which mutual fund am i talking about i am talking about that mutual fund where less than or equal to 35% of the total money they have invested in equity shares of domestic companies so in equity shares of domestic companies they have invested only up to 35% major investment is in debt so specified mutual funds are those mutual funds where in equity shares they have invested only 35% so if your capital asset happens to be <clears throat> market linked debentures or units of specified mutual fund concept number 1 is that uh, doesn't matter what the period of holding is the period of holding is going to be irrelevant the capital gains will always be short term capital gains only and point number 2 because they short term capital gains always irrespective of the period of holding you will not get any indexation benefit over here and point number 3 your final point under market linked debentures that whether long term whether short term doesn't matter whatever capital gains you get over here these capital gains will be only normal rate tax basically normal rate capital gains special rate of taxation will not apply 
it's always going to be short term capital gains only first of all it cannot be long term capital gains and you will not get any indexation benefit point number 2 of course no indexation benefit because um it is short term it's considered as short term always and point number 3 the capital gains whatever capital gains arises the short term capital gains we will tax the short term capital gains only at normal rate and not special rate taxation this is it about market linked debentures and and one more point you can say that uh, when will the transfer happen when these market linked debentures get redeemed upon redemption upon maturity when the market linked debentures are matured or when they redeemed even that will be considered as transfer okay simple points guys this is it about market linked debentures so market linked debentures are those debentures where the return depends upon the return depends upon what the, re the return that is the interest depends upon the market returns and they are also talking about units of specified mutual funds wherein up to 35% up to 35% of the uh, money of the mutual fund is invested in equity shares all right guys then after this what did we learn after this we learned that um th there are totally four rules with respect to market linked debentures i don't care about the period of holding here the capital gains will always be short term capital gains only no indexation benefit and the capital gains will always be taxed at the a normal rate only over here and even redemption and maturity of these debentures even that will be considered as transfer okay so with this we have learnt about market linked debentures also all small simple easy amendments only can i take you to section 54 and 54f this is where the most interesting adjustments in capital gains exist let's revise let's discuss guys section 54 in section 54f let me discuss the section itself with you listen to me first of all i'm talking with you uh, talking to you about section 54 see in section 54 we'll go point by point okay who is the assessee tell me the assessee has to be only individual or huf right and what is the capital asset which this assessee has transferred what is the capital asset transferred capital asset transferred is some residential house property which is assessed to tax under ifhp some residential house property which is assessed to tax under ifhp which means tell me if i have a residential house property but it is still under construction it is an under construction residential house property and if i transfer this residential house property tell me can i even think about section 54 no i can't think about section 54 because if the property is still under construction then don't you think it will not be assessed under ifhp when does a property come to ifhp only when construction is over only when the property is ready only then the property comes to the ifhp head guys so what if my property is still under construction if my property is still under construction first of all it will not come to the ifhp head so if it doesn't come into ifhp head it will not form part of section 54 so now did you understand the significance of this point the residential property should be assessed under ifhp which means if it is under construction property it will not be assessed under ifhp then section 54 will not apply okay guys so condition 1 assessee has to be individual or huf condition 2 capital asset has to be a residential house property which is assessed under ifhp condition number 3 assessee has transferred this capital asset so because of transfer of this capital asset what kind of gains has the assessee earned long term capital gains so it should be long term capital asset all right guys it should be long term capital asset then comes my condition number 4 by selling this asset what is a new asset which the company is buying assessee selling away residential house property what is a new asset what is the company buying the company is allowed to buy only one residential house property where only one residential house property assessee is allowed to buy where in india but however there is an exception guys what is the exception tell me in the exception how many houses am i going to allow you to buy in the exception two residential house properties i will allow you to buy where in india but what are the conditions for this condition number 1 i will let you do this only once in the lifetime of the assessee and condition number 2 is that the ltcg has to be within how much ltcg has to be within 2 crores right guys so condition number 1 assessee is individual or huf condition number 2 assessee has transferred a residential house property assessed under ifhp condition number 3 assessee has earned ltcg condition number 4 the assessee has purchased one residential house property in india or assessee can also buy two residential house properties in india but that is allowed only once in the lifetime of the assessee 
that too if LTCG is within two crores. Now to get this new asset, what is the time limit which is allowed to the assessee to get this new asset? See, it depends. Is the assessee purchasing the new residential house property or is the assessee constructing the new residential house property? See, all the time limits will be from the date of transfer. From the date of transfer, if the assessee is purchasing, assessee can purchase this new property one year before the date of transfer or within two years from the date of transfer. But if the assessee is constructing the residential house property, then from the date of transfer, within three years, the assessee must complete the construction of the residential house property. So this is a time limit. Then listen to the fifth point. This uh, assessee has bought this new house, right? Now, what is the lock-in period? For how many years does the assessee have to keep this new house? The assessee has to keep this new residential house property for three years. Within the three years, what the assessee should not do? Within these three years, assessee should not transfer the residential house property. But what if the SSE transfers within three years? What if there is a violation? If there is a violation, see if, if there is a violation, then what will happen? What will you go in? Uh, what will you go in? Um, attack straight away. If there is a violation, you will straight away go and attack the cost of acquisition of this new property. From the cost of acquisition of the new residential house property, what will you subtract? Whatever section 54 exemption you have already enjoyed, you will subtract. Understanding everybody? And finally, the sixth point, the capital gains deposit account scheme. That concept is applicable. I'm not going too much into the CGDA discussion because this is one whole discussion altogether. And here there is no amendment. So whatever I've discussed with you till here, this is the existing section 54. I haven't even spoken about the amendment. The amendment over here is that under section 54, what is the maximum exemption that you can enjoy? The maximum exemption that you can enjoy is 10 crores in a year. So basically per annum, this 10 crore is per annum limit. In a year, how much maximum exemption you can enjoy? In a year, the maximum exemption that you can enjoy is 10 crores only. I will of course give you some examples to help you understand this better but before we come to this example can we revise the whole of section 54 once guys? Come on let's discuss. So under section 54 point number one assessee has to be an individual or HUF and this assessee has transferred what? This assessee has transferred a residential house property which is assessed to tax under the head IFHP. Assessee has transferred a residential house property which is assessed to tax under the head uh, house property which itself means under construction properties we are not talking about. And then uh, because of this transfer assessee should have earned LTCG and um, assessee should be buying a new asset. What is the new asset which the assessee is buying? One residential house property in India. But once in the lifetime of the assessee, if LTCG is not within two, is, if LTCG is within two crores, then SSE can claim exemption for two residential house properties also. Now, within how much time assessee has to buy this new house? Either assessee can purchase a new house or assessee can construct the new house. If assessee is purchasing the new house, the purchase has to be completed one year before transfer or two years after transfer. If assessee is constructing, assessee has to complete the construction within three years from transfer. This new property, assessee has to keep with himself for at least three years. Within three years, assessee should not transfer. Within three years, if the assessee transfers the house, what will happen? There will be a violation of lock-in period. If there is a violation of lock-in period, this new house cost of acquisition, from that we will subtract whatever 54 exemption we have enjoyed. Capital gains deposit account scheme concept will apply and the new amendment. What is the new amendment guys? The amendment is that under section 54, what is the maximum exemption you can enjoy? Maximum only 10 crore ex exemption you can enjoy. Now keeping this point in mind, can you help me finish this question? I have four situations for you. In these four situations, you have to tell me what is going to be our exempt LTCG under section 54 exemption how much you will enjoy and what's going to be your taxable LTCG this is what you're going to tell me okay LTCG is 7 crores guys I spent for the new house 12 crores how much exemption you will give me tell me the new house is 12 crores LTCG is 7 crores you will give me only 7 crores exemption because tell me can the exemption be more than capital gains you know very well, no. Can exemption be more than capital gains? No. So you will restrict the exemption to capital gains 7 crores. So 7 crores is your LTCG. 
seven crores is exemption. So what's going to be your taxable LTCG, guys? Taxable LTCG will be zero. Nothing at all. Then answer my second subdivision. In the second subdivision, the LTCG is 12 crores. We invested 14 crores in the new house. Again, tell me, can exemption be more than LTCG? No. So I will restrict the exemption to what? I will restrict the exemption to LTCG. I will restrict it to 12 crores. But tell me, what is a maximum exemption you can enjoy under section 54? Only 10 crores. So, so my LTCG is 12 crores, but how much exemption you will enjoy? Only 10 crores. So what will be your taxable LTCG? The balance 2 crores. Now did you understand? Yes, my LTCG was uh, 12 crores guys. Out of which my exemption, 14 crores we spent for the new house. First of all, I will restrict it to 12 crores because exemption can't be more than LTCG. You can't have a negative number because of exemption, no. So I will restrict the exemption to 12 crores first, but it cannot be more than 10 crore. So exemption, I will get only 10 crore balance taxable. Now, what about the third one? LTCG is 11 crore. The cost of the new house is 9 crore. So how much exemption you will give me? 9 crore exemption you will give me. Now 9 crores is within 10 crores also. So 11 crores is my LTCG. 9 crores is the exemption. So what's going to be my taxable LTCG? The balance 2 crore taxable LTCG. And now coming to my last situation, my LTCG is 15 crores. I spent 13 crores for the new house. So you will give me 13 crores exemption, but you will restrict it to how much? You will restrict it to 10 crores because under section 15, 54, your exemption should not exceed 10 crores. So 13 crores, but you will restrict it to 10 crores. So 15 crores is your LTCG. 10 crores is your exemption. So what's your taxable LTCG now? The balance 5 crore. Simple. Yes, this is it about our discussion with respect to section 54. Understood everybody? Are we all having perfect clarity in this regard as well? Yes, so this was section 54 discussion. Section 54, what is the amendment? The amendment is that maximum how much exemption you can enjoy, 10 crores only you can enjoy. Okay, now listen, our next discussion uh, is going to be section 54F. I have just, I've straight away uh, copied section 54 as it is so that I can show you where exactly the differences are between section 54 and 54F. See, even under 54F, the asset has the assessee has to be individual or HUF, and the capital asset over here has to be any long-term capital asset. It can be any long-term capital asset, just that it should not be what? Just that it should not be residential house property. Understanding in section 54F, assessee can transfer any long-term capital asset, just that it should not be residential house property. And on the date of, okay, I'll come to that later. Listen to the next point. Even over here, we're talking only about LTCG, even over here, assessee is going to buy only one residential house property in India. But here you don't have these two properties once in a lifetime. That exception, you don't have one property only, one residential house property only. Then listen, on the date of transfer, how many residential house properties can the assessee own on the date of transfer? If I ignore, if I ignore this new property, if I ignore the new residential house property, maximum how many residential house properties the assessee can own? The assessee can own only one residential house property. Apart from the new house property, assessee can own only one another residential house property. Are you all listening? Are you all following? So under section 54, assessee is individual or HUF. Assessee is transferring any long-term capital asset which is not residential house property and assessee has earned long-term capital gains. And what is the assessee buying guys? Assessee is going to buy one residential house property in India but however, uh, 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 but this once in lifetime concept is not applicable in 54F. On the date of transfer, if I ignore this new house, maximum only one another residential house assessee can own. Time limit is the same. Assessee has to purchase the house one year before transfer or two years after transfer. Or if assessee is constructing, assessee must complete the construction within three years from transfer. Okay. Uh, even over here, the lock-in period is three years. Within three years, assessee should not 
transfer. Now, within three years, if the assessee transfers, if there is a violation, then what will be the consequence of the violation? Within the three years period, if the assessee uh, transfers the property, then in that case, whatever section 54F exemption assessee had enjoyed earlier, how much ever section 54F exemption assessee had enjoyed, this will be now taxed as LTCG when in the year of, in the previous year, in the, in, in the, in, in the, in the previous year of violation, whatever um, capital gains 54F exemption was enjoyed earlier will now be taxed as LTCG. Okay, guys. Then listen, even over here, the capital gains deposit account scheme concept is applicable. And here there is one more unique point and the unique point is about section 54F exemption. How much exemption do you get over here? We have the formula, right? The formula is amount invested in the new house into LTCG by net consideration. This is how much section 54F exemption you will get. So whatever you're investing in the new house, fully you will not get exemption. Only on the basis of this formula, you will get the exemption. Now, where is the amendment? The amendment is that this amount invested in the new house, this can be maximum only 10 crores. Are you understanding? The amendment is that the amount invested should not be more than 10 crores. This is the amendment. The rest of it is normal, usual 54F only. So under 54F, assessee is individual or HUF. Assessee has transferred any long-term capital asset, uh, just that it should not be residential house property. And what has the assessee uh, bought? Assessee is going to buy one residential house property in India. We don't have the exception of buying two houses in 54F. Then on the date of transfer, if I ignore this new house, maximum only one more house assessee can own. Time limit is same two years and three years. Lock-in period is same three years. But if the assessee violates the lock-in period, did you notice I am not going to target the cost of acquisition number. If the lock-in period is violated, then 54F exemption, whatever assessee had enjoyed earlier, it will now be taxed as LTCG in the year of violation. CGD account concept will apply and then the, ex the exemption will be proportionate calculation like this and the amendment is that this amount invested can be maximum only 10 crores and not more than that. Now, let us take an example to help us understand this better. Look at this everybody. I have a set of situations for you. It is these situations which will help us understand and grasp this uh, concept of 54F better. Listen, I'll just align the lines. Hmm. Listen now. I have five situations. In the first situation, our net consideration is 15 crores. 7.5 crores is the LTCG. And cost of the new house. Cost of the new house, don't you think this is nothing but the amount which is invested in the new residential house? Do you agree, guys? Cost of the house is nothing but amount invested in the new residential house property. Right, guys. So, what is my formula? My formula is amount invested into LTCG by net consideration. And what is the amendment? That amount invested should not be more than 10 crores. See, the amount invested is 12 crores. So, first of all, I will restrict it to how much? I will restrict it to 10 crores. So, how will I do the calculation for this amount invested 10 crore into what is the LTCG net? Uh, LTCG 7.5 crore divided by what is the net consideration? 15 crores. So, what is my exact? Exemption, tell me, how much is my section 54F exemption? 10 into 7.5 by 15. This is going to be 5 crores. So what's going to be a taxable LTCG? LTCG 7.5 crore out of which 5 crore is exempt. So 2.5 crore will be taxable. Very simple. Are you noticing? The only amendment is that this amount invested, I will restrict to 10 crores. See, in section 54, what was the amendment? In section 54, maximum exemption was how much? Maximum exemption was 10 crores. In 54F, what is the amendment? This amount invested, this should not exceed 10 crores. Okay. Now, similarly, answer my second situation. Even here, amount invested is 15 crores. So, first of all, I will restrict this to 10 crores, guys. So what is the amount invested 10 crores into my LTCG is 12 crores divided by net consideration which is 20 crores. This is going to be how much? This is going to be 6 crores. 6 crores is my exemption. So LTCG 12 crores, 6 crore exempt, balance 6 crore taxable. Okay. Then my third situation, amount invested is 8 
crores. This I will take as 8 crores as it is, right? Because it is within 10 crore. So here how much will be the exemption? Amount invested 8 crores into LTCG which is 12 crore divided by net consideration which is 16 crores. So 8 into 12 by 16, this is going to be 6 crores. So out of uh, 12 crore LTCG, 6 crore is exempt, balance 6 crore is taxable. Understanding? Yes. Then comes our fourth situation. In the fourth situation, I spent 10 crore in the new house. It is within 10 crore only. So I can take this number as it is. So here if you see amount invested is 10 crore into LTCG, 6 crore by net consideration, 10 crore. So how much is going to be your Exemption over here, 6 crore is going to be exemption. So LTCG is 6 crore, 6 crore is exempt. So nothing is going to be taxable, right? Zero taxable, nothing is going to be taxable. Then comes our last situation over here. We spent 12 crores to buy the new house. So first of all, we will restrict it to how much? 10 crores. So how will we calculate now? What is the amount invested? 10 crores into the LTCG, which is 6 crores, by net consideration, which is 12 crores. So this is going to be 5 crores. 5 crores will be our exemption. So how much capital gains we earned? 6 crore, out of which 5 crore is exempt. So the balance 1 crore is going to be taxable. Understood everybody? So if I have to summarize now, in section 54, what am I, what is the amendment? In section 54, the maximum exemption can be how much? The maximum exemption can be 10 crore. In section 54F, what is the amendment? In section 54, the amount invested has to be maximum 10 crores. Are we all crystal clear with our amendment? Capital gains amendment, that's all guys. This is it with our discussion with respect to the capital gains amendment. Perfect understanding, everybody harrow with this entire discussion. Yes, so in capital gains, we have spoken about all our uh, amendments. We've spoken about the exclusion, CII, intangible asset, self-generated, what's the cost of acquisition? Zero. And then we have spoken about the housing loan interest will not be included in cost of acquisition, cost of improvement. If it is already claimed as a deduction over here, then EGR we spoke about, market-linked debentures also we've discussed, 54 and 54F two amendments. This is the most important amendment in capital gains. The amendment in both the amendments, what's the common number? The common number is 10 crores. Okay. So with this, I think we are good to close our uh, capital gains amendments. Let's now go to our IFOS discussion. In the IFOS discussion, there are only four amendments, guys. The first amendment is with respect to gift received uh, by a, uh, by a non-resident. Any gift received by a non-resident or um, RNOR. This is the first amendment. The second amendment is under section 56 to 7b and the third amendment is with respect to section 115 BBJ which talks about your net winnings from online games and your fourth amendment is with respect to section 1010d the proceeds from life insurance policy. Four amendments only. Let's take them up one by one. Uh, except this, the remaining are very simple. Let, let me discuss them all with you one by one. Let's discuss first of all a, a simple amendment. Any gift received by a, a non-resident or RNOR. Now here the concept goes like this. See, if a resident is giving a gift to a non-resident or to our NOR, then this gift, my question to you is, where is this gift accruing? Where is the source of this gift? Where is this gift arising? Where is this gift earned? What will you say? If resident is giving a gift, you will say that this gift is earned in India. The source of this gift is in India. Now, you might wonder that, ma'am, what is the amendment over here? The amendment is, we're talking about RNOR also over here. Earlier, this provision was only for NR. That if NR is receiving a gift from a resident, the source is in India. So, now they are talking to us about RNOR also. 
now they're talking to us about rnor also under rnor what is our learning over here under rnor our learning is even if rnor is receiving any gift from a resident where is the source of the gift the source is in india Understood everybody? Simple point. If resident is giving you a gift, the source of the gift is in India. Earlier, this rule was only for non-resident assessees. Now, this is for RNOR assessee also. All right. Now, I'm taking you to the uh, second discussion. By the way, do you agree over here? Who is the assessee? This person is the assessee. No. In IFOS head, who is the assessee? The recipient of gift is the assessee, right? So this is the person who is receiving the gift. So if the assessee is NR or RNOR, if they receive a gift from resident, source is in India. So if source is in India, what will happen? What big thing? If source is in India, it becomes an Indian income. And if it's an Indian income, it will become taxable, guys. This is the provision. Okay. Now I'm taking you to the second amendment. The second amendment is with respect to section 56 to 7b. Section 56 to 7b. It's a very small amendment, guys. But I'll still discuss the whole section with you so that you get a revision also. Listen to me. What are we talking about? Section 56 to 7b. See, what does 56 to 7b say? 56 to 7b says condition, uh, or let me draw the diagram. Let's say there is a closely held company. Closely held company means a company in which public is not interested. This closely held company has issued uh, shares. This closely held company has issued shares can be either preference shares or equity shares to a person. Okay, now this person may be a resident or a non-resident. Now against these shares, this person will give the closely held company the issue price of these shares, guys. Right, now this issue price, if you see, this issue price, if you see, is uh, this, this uh, point number one, this issue, this issue price should be above the face value. Which means the securities are issued at a premium, guys. And also, this issue price should be more than the FMV. So, if all these conditions, whatever I've put over here, if all these conditions are fulfilled, then for the closely held company, uh, Section 56.27b, IFOS will come into the picture. 56.27b under the head IFOS, this says that Whatever is the difference between the issue price and the FMV, that will be taxed as IFOS under 56.27b for whom? 56.27b will apply to whom, guys? 56.27b is applying to the closely held company. Who is the SSE over here? The closely held company. Are we understanding this? So under 50, so what's the amendment over here? Very small amendment. Everything else you already know. The only amendment is that here this giver can be non-resident also. Earlier we used to apply 56 to 7B only if the uh, uh, shareholder is a resident. But here we are now, amendment is now applying this section to the non-resident also. Understood. Yes, so I'll repeat once again. So can we can we summarize 56 to 7B? What are all the conditions under 56 to 7B? Condition number one, tell me, what kind of a company? Closely held company, guys. Condition number two, uh, who is the uh, shareholder? The shareholder is going to be resident or non-resident. And what is the security that we're talking about? We're talking only about shares over here. Can be equity shares or can be preference shares. Condition number four, the issue price is more than face value, which means the, the shares are issued at a premium. And condition number five is that the issue price is more than FMV. Okay, I have five conditions. If all these five conditions are fulfilled, then what happens? If all these five conditions are fulfilled, that is when section 56.27b will come into the picture. 56 to 7b is going to trouble whom? Will 56 to 7b trouble the shareholder? No. 56 to 7b is going to trouble whom, guys? 56 to 7b is going to trouble the closely held company. Now, what does 56 to 7b say? The assessee will be the closely held company. And what is going to be uh, taxable for this assessee under the head IFOS? The difference between the issue price and the FMB, this difference will be taxable for the closely held company. Like, for example, let's say the issue price happens to be uh, 15 rupees. The face value happens to be rupees 10 and the FMV happens to be rupees 3 let us say. 
So now see, issue price is more than face value. Issue price is also more than FMV. So the difference between issue price and FMV that is 12 rupees. This is what will be taxed under 5627B for whom? For the closely held company. Okay. The first amendment was that if your assessee is a resident or a non-resident and if he is receiving any gift from a resident, the source of the gift is in India. Second amendment is that under 5627B, if closely held company is receiving issue price from a resident or not resident, uh, issue price more than face value, also more than FMV, then the difference between issue price and FMV will be taxed under 5627B. Now listen to the third amendment. So we've learned the first two amendments. First one we spoke about was about gift by non-resident uh, gift received by a non-resident or RNOR and a second amendment was 5627B. Now let's come to section 115 BBJ. Now under section 115 BBJ, what are we talking about? We are talking about net winnings from online games, net winnings from online games. Now um, listen carefully, if I participate in any online game, for example, let's say some Ludo app, I won some money on some Ludo game, or let's say I won some money on Rummy Circle or let's say I won some money on Dream 11. So any 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 winnings if I have from online games, uh, we will see the net winnings. These net winnings will be taxed at a special rate of 30%. So of course, what does it become guys? It becomes a special rate income. Yes, whatever net winnings you have from online games, I will tax them at a special rate of 30%. Now tell me, uh, to win this amount, if I had incurred any expenditure, can I subtract the expenditure? No, expenditure will not be allowed to earn this winnings, to, to, to make this winnings, whatever expense you incurred, I will not allow you to, uh, I will not let you subtract it. Like for example, let's say you had to make an account on Dream 11. To make an account on Dream 11, some entrance fee you had to pay, let us say, some initial fees you had to pay. I will not let you subtract these kind of expenses. Whatever are your winnings from the online games, I will straight away tax them at 30%. If you have incurred any expense to earn these winnings, I will not subtract those expenses. Okay, then comes my next point. In case you have any chapter 6a deductions, can you enjoy chapter 6a deductions against net winnings? No, it is not allowed. Against 115 BBJ income, against these winnings, you can't subtract chapter 6a also. Then if you have any uh, basic exemption limit, can basic exemption limit be adjusted against net winnings? No, even basic exemption limit cannot be allowed against these income. Also, if you have any losses, can you set off these losses against these winnings? No. See, from the same game, if you have suffered a loss, I am using the word net winnings. Are you understanding the significance of net winnings? Like for example, I played two Ludo games. One Ludo game, I won some amount. Another Ludo game, I lost an amount. These two, I will set off. From the same online game, if I'm winning and I'm losing, I can set them off and I will take only the net winnings. But other losses, if I have, can I set them off against these winnings? No. Other losses, I can't set off against these winnings. I will not allow. Simple section. This is section 115 BBJ. Getting it? So under section 115 BBJ, uh, in case you have any net winnings from online games, I will tax them at a special rate of 30%, flat 30% tax guys. Any expenditure, I will not let you allow. Chapter 60 deductions also, I will not let you allow. Basic exemption limit also, I will not let you enjoy. And if you have suffered any losses, even that I will not let you set off. Okay, so this was a third discussion with respect to section 115 BBJ. Now coming to section 1010D, 1010D is a big, huge amendment under our um, uh, in, for, uh, under Finance Act 2023 amendments. This one amendment itself will take us around one, one and a half hours if we have to understand it in depth. So that is why for this particular amendment, I have already put up another video on my YouTube channel exclusively for 1010D 
प्लीज एंश्योर यू वॉच दैट ओके बट फॉर नाउ जस्ट टू एंश्योर दैट इवन दिस वीडियो इज सॉर्ट ऑफ कंप्लीट आई गिव यू अ वेरी वेरी समराइज वर्जन ऑफ द टेन टेन डी अमेंडमेंट ओके सो आई एम जस्ट गिविंग यू अ समराइज वर्जन ऑफ दिस अमेंडमेंट प्लीज नो दैट इन फुल डिटेल इट इज ऑलरेडी देयर ऑन माई यूट्यूब चैनल यू कैन वॉच इट फ्रॉम देयर इट सेल्फ आई जस्ट गिव यू अ समरी ऑफ इट नाउ so under section 1010d uh, i'll give you a very simple uh, analysis see listen if you if you've taken a life insurance policy we are talking about life insurance policy okay you need to have some background knowledge before i come to the amendment so if you've taken any life insurance policy before 1st april 2003 okay then uh, whatever premium uh, how much ever premium you are paying doesn't matter if your policy was taken before 1st april 2003 whatever proceeds you get doesn't even matter it's going to be fully exempt from tax okay then listen if your policy was taken on or after 1st april 2003 but the policy was taken before 1st april 2012 in that case the premium which you are paying on the life insurance policy has to be within 20% of the sum assured if it is within 20% of your sum assured then whatever proceeds you get from this policy it will be exempt if the premium is more than 20% of sum assured then the proceeds which you get later will be taxable okay so if the premium is within 20% of sum assured the proceeds will be exempt but if the premium is more than 20% of sum assured then the proceeds will be taxable okay then comes my third point if the uh, policy is taken on or after 1st april 2012 then in that case the premium has to be within 10% of sum assured so if the premium is within 10% of sum assured then whatever proceeds you get from this policy will be fully exempt but if you get more than 10% if if the premium is more than 10% of sum assured whatever proceeds you get later will be fully taxable all right guys then comes my next point if the policy is taken on or after 1st april 2013 the person on whose life the policy is taken that is the insured this insured is either a disabled person or this insured happens to be a person who is suffering from a disease a specified disease as per section 80 ddp either he should be disabled or he should be suffering from a disease then in that case again i will look at the premium if the premium happens to be listen carefully if the premium happens to be within 15% of sum assured then the proceeds will be fully exempt if the premium is more than 15% of sum assured then the uh, proceeds will be taxable okay see are you noticing in this last situation which i have written did am i saying that the assessee has to be disabled does the assessee have to be disabled not necessarily in this last situation who is going to be disabled guys who is going to be disabled the insured the person in whose name the life insurance policy is taken that person is going to be disabled you are getting it so uh, once again when i talk about section 1010d before we come to 10 uh, 1010d is talking about the exemption of proceeds so if the policy is taken before 1st april 2003 then whatever proceeds you get will be fully exempt if the proceed is before 1st april 2012 if premium is within 20% of sum assured then proceeds will be exempt if the uh, policy is on or after 1st april 2012 then the premium has to be within 10% of sum assured only then the proceeds will be exempt if the policy is taken on or after 1st april 2013 on the life of a person who is disabled or who is suffering from a disease under section 80 ddb then whatever premium uh, then the premium should be within 15% of sum assured if it is within 15% of sum assured then again the proceeds will be fully exempt all right if the premiums are more than these limits then the proceeds will be straight to be taxable then listen to one more point the amendment if the policy is taken on or after 1st april 2023 if the policy is taken on or after 1st april 2023 then the aggregate premiums of such policies has to be within 5 lakhs if it is within 5 lakhs then whatever proceeds you get later it will be fully exempt if it is more than 5 lakhs then the proceeds you get will be 
taxable okay so up to 5 lakh policies where your premium is up to 5 lakh will be exempt the balance policies where the premium is exceeding 5 lakhs there whatever proceeds you get will be taxable getting it guys so this is the amendment the amendment is if the policy is taken on or after 1st april 2023 if the aggregate premium of these policies is within 5 lakhs and whatever proceeds you get will be exempt but if your aggregate premium is more than 5 lakh, then those policies where premium is within 5 lakh, the proceeds will be exempt. The remaining policies where the uh, premium is exceeding 5 lakhs, there it's going to be, the proceeds are going to be taxable. Okay. Now, under 1010D, we can summarize this entire section with the help of a simple flowchart. That flowchart is what I want to discuss with you over here. Listen to me. The first thing that you will have to check is, what kind of a policy is it? See, the policy should not be key man insurance policy. The policy should not be ULIP. The policy should also not be term life insurance policy. It should be any other policy only. Don't worry, guys. All this is also there in the uh, amend in, in the 1010 d amendment video, which I'm asking you to watch for this particular amendment. All this is there in that video also. Okay. Uh, but there is a lot more detailed form with a lot of examples, a lot of examples and all you will find in that particular video. That's why I'm insisting you ensure you watch that video also. Okay, so um, if the, the first of all, the policy should not be KMIP, ULIP or term life insurance policy, it should be any other policy. Then you will see when did you receive the money? Did you receive the money on this policy upon death of the insured or did you, or whatever proceeds you have received? Is it not related to death? Okay. Is the proceeds related to death or is it not related to death? See, if the proceeds are, rela are received relating to death, then in that case, it will always be exempt under section 1010D. It will be the proceeds, the proceeds will be exempt under section 1010D. Even if the premium is more than 20%, more than 10%, more than 15%, still, if the money is received upon death, then it will be exempt under 1010D, simple as that. Okay. If the proceeds are not related to death, you will first of all check is the premium, whatever premium you have paid, is a premium within 10% number, 15% number, 20% number. Sometimes 10% number is applicable, sometimes 15, sometimes 20, right? It's a premium within these numbers. If the premium is within these, uh, no, wait, 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 one second. One small correction, it's a premium more than these numbers. If the premium is more than 10, 15, 20, you don't even have to check anything else. If the premium is more than these numbers, then whatever proceeds you get, those proceeds will be taxable. You will not enjoy any exemption, guys. The proceeds will fully be taxable, right, guys? But however, what if the premium happens to be within 10%, within 15%, within 20%? If the premium is within 10, 15, 20, then what is the only thing we have to check about? The 5 lakh number, guys, everything else is fulfilled. Only 5 lakh number we have to check about. And 5 lakh number will apply only if the policy is taken um, on or after uh, 1st April 2023. So if the premium is within 10, 15, 20, we will see when was the policy taken was the policy taken before before 1st april 2023 or was the policy taken on or after 1st april 2023 if the policy is taken before 1st april 2023 will you check the 5 lakh number no nothing else is there to check so you will say that whatever proceeds you've received those proceeds will be exempt under section 1010 d Right, guys, because see, the premium is within the limit also and a 5 lakh number also will not apply. So whatever money you've received will be fully exempt. But however, where is the amendment? The amendment is in this part. The amendment is if the policy is taken on or after 1st April 2023, then you will see what is the aggregate premium. Is the premium within 5 lakh? If the premium is within 5 lakhs, then same thing, whatever proceeds you get, those proceeds will be fully exempt under section 1010D. But however, if the premium happens to be more than 5 lakhs, then in that case, the proceeds will be taxable for you. So the amendment for you is that if the policy is not KMIP, ULIP or term life insurance policy, if it is any other policy and from this policy you've received money but not relating to death and the premium is within 10%, 15% or 20% as the case may be and the policy is taken on or after 1st April 2023, if the premium is more than 5 lakhs, then the proceeds are going to be taxable. 
So this is the amendment. I'll repeat the amendment once again. If the policy is not Keyman insurance policy or ULIP or term life insurance policy, if it happens to be any other policy, it happens to be any other policy and you've received money but not relating to death, okay? And the premium is within 10%, 15% or 20% as a case may be. And the policy is taken on or after 1st April 2023, all right? And the premium is also more than 5 lakhs. Then if all these conditions are fulfilled, whatever sum of money you have received, whatever proceeds you receive, the proceeds will be taxable. Getting it, guys? So, this is it about our 1010D uh, discussion. So, with this, all our four points under IFOS we've discussed. We spoke about gift received by NR, RNOR. We spoke about 5627B. We spoke about 115 BBJ, net winnings from online games and 1010D also, okay? 1010D, I hope you understood. If the policy is taken on or after 1st April 2023, then only you will think about the 5 lakhs number. Okay, so it has to be any other policy. If the policy, if money is received upon death, then it is always going to be exempt. So the policy, the money should not be received upon death. If the money, if the premium is more than 10, 15, 20, it's anyways going to be taxable. So premium should be within 10, 15, 20. If policy is taken before 1st April 2023, 5 lakhs number will not come into the picture. So if premium is within 10, 15, 20 and policy is taken before 1st April 2020, uh, 1st April 2023, without even looking at the 5 lakhs number, you can conclude that the proceeds are exempt. But if the policy is taken on or after 1st April 2023, then we'll have to look at the premium. If the premium is within 5 lakhs and exempt, if the premium is more than 5 lakh, then whatever uh, proceeds you've received, those proceeds will be taxable for you. No exemption under 1010D. Understanding everybody? So with this, we'll close our discussion with respect to IFOS also. All right. So you understood my final conditions. Con uh, the condition is that it should be any other policy and the money should not be relating to death. Premium should be within 10, 15, 20. Policy is taken on or after 1st April 2023 and the premium is more than 5 lakhs. Then whatever proceeds you've received, those proceeds will be taxable. Can I take you to our next discussion now? Yes, guys. Come on, come on, come on. Last part of our discussion. We'll take up the chapter 6A discussion now. Listen to me. Chapter 6A only. Three simple amendments only we have in chapter 6A. Won't take us much time also. So chapter 6A, three things we have to learn about. We have to learn about number one. A new section which they have inserted, section 80 CCH. Then number two, we have an amendment in section 80 G. And then we also have to learn about an amendment in section 10 AA. Three things we have to learn about. Let's take them up one by one. First of all, I am discussing with you about section 80 CCH. Coming to section 80 CCH, 80 CCH is a very simple section. Here we're talking about contribution which is made to the Agni Veer Corpus Fund. So basically what happened is uh, the government came up with the Agni Pat scheme. The Agni Pat scheme is to encourage a uh, youth, Indian youth to join the Indian Army. So if you're in, if you're, a, if, uh, if you join the Indian Army, then 30% of your uh, compensation will be contributed to the Agni Veer Corpus Fund. So what happens in ATCCH is that the Agni Veer, who is this Agni Veer? The Agni Veer is, the Agni Veer is that Indian youth who is joining the Indian Army. So this Agni Veer, he will be making his contribution to the Agni Veer Corpus Fund. Similarly, even the central government will be making its contribution to the Agnivir Corpus Fund. See, just like how employer and employee both contribute to RPF uh, to save for the employee's retirement, same way even over here, the uh, army person and the central government both are going to contribute to this Agnivir Corpus Fund for whose benefit? For the benefit of Agnivir. So totally how many transactions are you seeing? Totally two transactions you're seeing, guys. Now, listen very, very carefully. How is this going to work? 
uh, it's a very simple section. See, point number one, if I talk about the Agniveer's own contribution, the Agniveer's own contribution, he will get a deduction under section 80 CCH, subsection 1. Whatever he contributes, his entire amount, he will get as a deduction under 80 CCH, subsection 1. And then what is the second uh, transaction over here? The second transaction over here is the central government's contribution. Now, point number one, don't you think the central government's contribution to the Agnivir Corpus Fund is a benefit for the Agnivir? Because this money is going to be enjoyed by whom? By the Agnivir only later, right? So it's a huge benefit for the Agnivir. So whatever the central government is contributing, it will first of all be taxable as income, taxable as salary income for whom? It will first be taxable as salary for the Agnivir. So for the Agnivir, whatever contribution he is getting from the central government, it's a benefit for him. Any benefit you get from your employer will be taxed under the salary set. So the central government's contribution, we will tax it for the Agnivir under the salary set. In addition to that, whatever the central government's contribution, we will fully also allow it under ATCCH subsection 2. ATCCH subsection 2 deduction you will get. Then the third point, once Agnivir retires, he will withdraw money from the Agnivir Corpus Fund, right? So any amount which is withdrawn from Agnivir Corpus Fund, this is going to be fully exempt from tax. That's all guys. A very simple section, section 80 CCH. So under section 80 CCH, uh, Agnivir is also making a contribution. Central government is also making a contribution. The Agnivir's contribution, 80 CCH, subsection 1. The central government's contribution will first be taxed for the Agnivir under the head salaries. Then whatever is the contribution for the Agnivir under 80 CCH subsection 2, it will be allowed as a deduction. Later from this corpus fund, whatever he withdraws, is going to be fully exempt from tax. Okay, this was our first uh, amendment under chapter 6A, 80 CCH. Now coming to our second amendment under uh, chapter 6A, this is with respect to section 80G. A very small amendment, guys. In section 80G, you have totally four categories of deductions right in the first category of deduction you get 100% deduction second category you get 50% deduction third category you get 100% deduction but subject to a qualifying limit fourth category you get 50% deduction but subject to a qualifying limit right guys this is how section 80g works now under section 80g where is the amendment the amendment is in this part see in this part you must have learned totally four uh four um uh, uh, donations you must have learned over here number one any donation made to the Jawaharlal uh, Nehru Memorial Fund, any donation made to Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial Fund, then any donation made to Indira Gandhi Memorial Fund, any donation made to Rajiv Gandhi Foundation, and then any donation made to Prime Minister Drought Relief Fund. So these are the four things you must have learned and you must have for sure learned these four things like you know this hint would have been for you that okay this is all Nehru family. Jawaharlal Nehru, his daughter Indira Gandhi, her son Rajiv Gandhi, this is how you would have learned it. Amendment is that these three have been removed from here and they have not been taken anywhere else. So if you make a donation to these three, you will not get any section ATG deduction at all. No section ATG deduction. Understanding everybody, if you make a contribution to Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial Fund or Indira Gandhi uh, Memorial Fund or Rajiv Gandhi Foundation, if you make a donation to any of uh, these uh, funds earlier you were getting 50 percent deduction now no deduction no section atg at all for these three simple guys did you did you follow this that's all that is it about the, the, the amendment under section atg okay now comes our last discussion under chapter 6a this is with respect to section 10 AA tax holiday now, when do you get this 10 AA tax holiday, guys? What are your conditions? Let me discuss the whole section with you. Condition number one, a SSE should be having an SEZ unit. Uh, condition number two, in this SEZ unit, the SSE must be either manufacturing goods or this assessee must be rendering services whether manufacturing goods whether rendering services when should the assessee have commenced when should the assessee have commenced the business assessee should have commenced the business on or before 31st march 2020 isn't assessee must have commenced the business then a uh, condition number three the assessee must have filed his Income tax return. Income tax return should have been filed within section 139.1 uh, due date. And the last condition is that the SSE should not be following 115 BAC, which means the SSE should have opted out of section 115 BAC. SSE should be following the normal provisions of the act. 
if all these conditions are fulfilled then you give your ssc 10 double deduction guys now how much 10 double deduction do you get how do you calculate see for the first 5 years the first 5 years 100% of the net profit which you have earned from export turnover divided by total turnover this is what you get as 10 double deduction in the next 5 years how much deduction do you get 50% of net profit which you have earned from export turnover divided by total turnover guys and in the next five years, the last five years, the same 50% number, the same 50% number or whatever is transferred to which reserve, whatever is transferred to SEZ reinvestment reserve, whichever is less is allowed as a deduction. Right. And then when you talk about export turnover, you will consider only that portion of export turnover which you have realized only that portion of export turnover which you have realized realized means what you should have brought it into india you should have realized the money and you should have brought it into india within six months from the end of previous year within six months from end of previous year like for for example for us uh, for our examination our previous year is 23 24 guys so what is the last day of 23 24 tell me the last day of 23 24 is going to be 31st March 2024 plus 6 months. This is going to be what? By 30th September 2024, we should bring the proceeds into India. See now, in this entire discussion, where is the amendment? There are totally two amendments. The first amendment is that we have to file the ITR within 139 due date. That was not there earlier. The second amendment is that we have to realize the export proceeds within six months from the end of the previous year. Learn 10 AA really well and go highly probable from your examination point of view. Understanding everybody, highly probable from your examination point of view. Yes, see, I'll give you the logic. I'll give you the logic behind the second amendment. There is a logic. I'll talk to you about this. See, why do we give 10 AA tax holiday? Because we're encouraging assessee to make export, right? Now, if the assessee has made an export, he has, and, and by the way, why are we encouraging export? We're encouraging export because when you export goods, you bring foreign currency into India. Now, if you're going to export, 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 but foreign currency is not going to come into India, should we encourage that also? No, isn't it? So that is why that is why we're telling the SSE export, export, export. But then bring the money, bring the foreign currency into India. Bring the foreign currency into India within how much time? Within six months from the end of the previous year, bring the money into India. Getting it, guys? So condition number one, uh, uh, SSE must be having an SEZ unit. Uh, and in that SEZ unit, SSE must be manufacturing goods or SSE must be rendering services. And condition number three, he must have commenced all this within 31st March 2020. He must have filed his ITR within 139 bond unit and he must have opted out of 115 BAC. If all these conditions are fulfilled, we will get 10 AA deduction. How to compute 10 AA, 100%, 50%, 50%, that you know. But the point, the second amendment is that when you're calculating this export turnover, you will consider only that part of export turnover, which we have brought into India, which we should have realized, we should have brought the foreign currency into India within how much time? Within six months from the end of the previous year, we should have brought the money into India. All right, this was section 10 AA for you. So with this, we have spoken about all the three things under our chapter 6A, section 80 CCH Agnipath, 80 G, uh, 80 CCH Agnipath scheme, 80 G donations, 10 AA tax holiday. All right, can we now go to the next discussion, the next chapter, which is going to be TDS TCS? No amendments in clubbing, no amendment in set off and carry forward of losses. Our next amendment is going to be with respect to uh, TDS, TCS and assessment procedures. Once I discuss this with you, I will be left with only one thing and that is section 115 BAC leftover discussion. Once we are done with this, we will be done with all our amendment discussion. Now, what are the things we have to discuss about over here? Listen to me, let's make our agenda first. First of all, we will talk about the exclusions, that what and all is excluded from this, from our syllabus. Then we have a small amendment in section 192, which talks about TDS on salary. We have another small amendment under section 192A, RPF withdrawal. 
then we have a small amendment under section, we have a new section, section 194BA, which is with respect to net winnings from online games. Then we have a small amendment under section 194N, which talks about cash withdrawals. Then we have an amendment in section 206AB, which is connected to 194BA. Then we have, uh, so all of this is TDS related. Okay. Then under TCS, if you see, we have two amendments. We have section 206C1G, which is an important amendment. Then we have section 206C small amendment. And this, these are TCS related amendments. And finally, with respect to assessment procedures, we have one small amendment with respect to PAN. Let's take them up now. Our very first amendment is the exclusions. Now, what are the sections which are excluded from your syllabus? See, number one, you don't have to learn about section 194E. We have 194E about foreign entertainers, foreign sports persons, foreign sports association, the 20% that section, we don't have to learn about that anymore, not in our syllabus. Then section 194EE, which talks about NSS, National Saving Certificate, even this is excluded. Then section 194IC, which talks about joint development agreements, specified agreements, even this is excluded. And finally, section 194O, your e-commerce operator, even this is excluded. So these sections are not a part of your syllabus anymore. So these are your exclusions. Now coming to your um, section 192. See what does section 192 talk about? Section 192 talks about TDS on salary. See, I'll straight away focus on the amendment. I'm not going uh, too much in depth in the uh, sections. I'm just going to focus on the amendment because anyways, TDS full-fledged revision, they're going to be doing on Monday uh, anyways, right? So therefore, I'm just focusing on the amendment alone here. Under section 192, what is the amendment? See, section 192 is with respect to TDS on salary. Okay. Now, you know very well, under section 192, uh, the tax is deducted by the employer at the slab rate. Whatever is the applicable slab rate, on that basis, the employer deducts the tax, right? So, under section 192, the new provision which they have inserted is that the employee has to tell the employer if the employee wants to opt out of section 115 BAC, he has to tell the employer. If the employee does not tell the employer, then by default, what will the employer assume? By default, employer will assume that assessee is following 115 BAC. The reason why this comes into the picture is under section 192, we deduct tax on slab rate, right? Are you understanding? Under section 192, we are discussing tax on slab rate. So the employer should know which slab rate he has to pick. Should he pick the slab rate as per, uh, should he pick the slab rate as per uh, 115 BAC or should he pick the slab rate as per uh, normal provisions? He has to know. So that is why what are we doing? That is why we are telling the employee that employee, listen, if you want to opt out of 115 BAC, tell the employer, inform the employer. Because if you don't inform the employer, employer will assume that you're going to follow 115 BAC by default. And on the basis of 115 BAC, employer will compute your income and compute your tax. So if you want to opt out, you inform the employer. Small, simple amendment. Okay. Then coming to the second amendment, uh, the next amendment, which is with respect to section 192A. Now, section 192A is with respect to RPF withdrawal. All right. So, the, I'll tell you what was the uh, provision briefly. Under section 192A, RPF withdrawal, what happens is that when the employee withdraws money from RPF, okay, if the withdrawal is less than 50,000, there is no TDS. If the withdrawal is equal to 50,000, then there is TDS at the rate of 10%. And also if the withdrawal is more than 50,000, even over there, we have a TDS at the rate of 10%. All right. And uh, in case the employee, see who's going to be the deductor over here. So basically, the um, uh, we have RPF and we have employee. So employee is withdrawing money from RPF guys. So when employee withdraws money from RPF, RPF deducts tax. So RPF becomes a deductor and the employee becomes a deductee. RPF will deduct tax at what rate? At the rate of 10%, but only if the withdrawal is at least 50,000. Okay, now this deductee, 
if he does not give his pan or his aadhar then what will happen if he does not give his pan or uh, he, he is neither giving his pan nor is he giving the aadhar guys if the deductee neither gives pan nor gives aadhar then earlier the rule was that under 192a tax will be deducted at maximum marginal rate now the amendment is if the uh, deductee is not giving pan also not giving aadhar then uh, tax will be deducted at the rate of 20% to not six double guys understanding simple section simple amendment only 192a is with respect to rpf withdrawal under uh, under rpf withdrawal if the employee uh, is a deductee is no, neither giving pan nor giving aadhar then earlier the rule was we will deduct tax at maximum marginal rate now the amendment is um, not maximum marginal rate we will deduct tax at the rate of 20% okay if if no pan aadhar if pan aadhar at least one is given then tds rate is 10% but if the deductee is neither giving pan nor giving aadhar then the tds rate will be 20% okay so this was section 192 and 192a now let's talk about the fourth amendment which is with respect to section 194 ba now under section 194 ba what are we talking about here we are talking about net winnings net winnings from online games section 115 bbj that we spoke about that's what we're talking about net winnings from online games like for example let's say uh you made an account on dream 11 and you have made some you have earned some winnings uh from dream 11 now when you withdraw the money from dream 11 when you withdraw the money at the time of withdrawal we will deduct tax who will deduct tax guys dream 11 will deduct tax so dream 11 will become the deductor and the person who has who has won the amount this person becomes a deductee now the deductor will deduct tax when will he deduct tax he will deduct tax at the time of withdrawal he will deduct tax basically when this person withdraws the winnings from his dream 11 account that is when he the dream 11 will deduct tax okay at the time of withdrawal but what if this person does not even withdraw the money if this money is not withdrawn then at the end of the previous year dream 11 will check that in your account how much winnings are there on that winnings they will deduct tax at what rate will they deduct tax they will deduct tax at the rate of 30% 30% guys just like section 115b so just like 195b uh, just like 194b 194b with respect to casual winnings just like 194bb horse race winnings even over here 194b also 30% so 194b 194bb these two are old sections and now new section 194ba all the three the tds rate is same 30% only till here also clear yes guys so net winnings whatever are your net winnings from the online games uh, at the time of withdrawal or if you don't withdraw then dream 11 will see at the end of the year how much uh, winnings are there in your account on that winnings they will deduct tax at the rate of 10% at at rate of 30% now see do you remember learning in 194b and 194bb only if the amount is more than 10000 only then they deduct tax at the rate of 30% guys but in 194b there is no such um, there is no such limit so even if it is a small amount uh, dream 11 will deduct tax you don't have the 10000 limit over here in 194b and bb you have the 10000 limit but in 194b no limit so therefore it will become inconvenient so that is why very recently faqs have been uh, released and in the faq it is mentioned that only if it is more than 100 rupees only if the winnings are more than 100 rupees only then they will deduct tax under section 194 ba because they have not given any 10000 limit over here so even small small amount if you ask dream 11 to deduct tax it will become very inconvenient so faqs have put the 100 rupees number that if the winnings are within 100 rupees then no need to deduct tax if the winnings are more than 100 rupees then only we will deduct tax then arises the question that what if the winnings happen to be in kind then what will how how will they deduct tax if the winnings happen to be in kind then in that case the deductor will have to ensure that uh, tds is deducted the deductor will have to ensure that um, tax is deducted properly the t the, the deductor will have to ensure that the tax is deducted the, the the tax is remitted to the department uh, who has to remit guys 
a bit up deep. So basically, dream 11 will have to ensure, like for example, if the winnings happen to be a car. Now, whatever is the TADS on the winnings, the deductee has to remit it to the government first. Okay. Then uh, the deductee will show Dream 11 Chalan proof. So the deductor will ensure that the tax has been remitted to the government. Only then the deductor will release the price. Your understanding? So if the winnings happen to be in kind, then we will tell the deductee you first remit the tax to the government. Show proof to Dream 11. Then only Dream 11 will deduct tax. Uh, only, only then Dream 11 will release the price. All right. So this is it about section 194BA, new section introduced guys with respect to net winnings from online games. 30% TDS rate, no threshold of 10,000 over here. So irrespective of what the winnings are, uh, the uh, Dream 11 will have to deduct the tax. But uh, FAQs say up to 100 rupees, no need to deduct tax, only if it is more than 100 deduct tax. And finally, we learned if the winnings happen to be in kind, deductee will have to first remit the tax to the government, show Chalan proof to the deductor, only then the deductor will release the price. Okay, so this was section 194BA. Now coming to your fifth amendment under TDS, which is section 194N. See 194N, which talks about TDS on cash withdrawals. Let me tell you what this uh, section says. It's a very, very important section from your examination point of view, not just because of the amendment, guys. Amendment is not important in section 194N. Apart from the amendment, the rest of the section is anyways very important. I'll tell you why the amendment is not very important because the amendment is with respect to cooperative society. That is why not very important, but still we should play safe. So listen to me. Under section 194N, what does the section say? See, let us say we have bank or cooperative bank or post office. Okay. And uh, we have Mr. Blue. Mr. Blue is an account holder. He has an account in bank, cooperative bank or post office. From his own account, he has withdrawn cash. So when he withdraws cash from his own account in this bank, cooperative bank or post office, at that time, 194N TDS comes into the picture. Now, uh, when should 194N tax be deducted? It depends upon the account holder. See, we will, uh, like for example, our current year is previous year 23-24. So previous year 23-24, see two years back. Two years back means what? Previous year 21-22, previous year 20-21 uh, uh, and previous year 19-20. In all these three years, if a SESI has not filed ITR, then a SESI, then in that case, uh, this, this Mr. Blue is an extreme defaulter. Okay. So, if, if you look at, uh, did you notice our current year is 23-24. What is the immediately preceding previous year? 22-23. I'm not talking about 22-23. I'm talking about three years before that. So, go two years back. Leave 22-23. Go two years back and then take three years. In these three years, if you see, all the three years SSE has not filed ITR. Okay. Then in that case, the limit will be like this. Up to 20 lakhs if you withdraw, no TDS. If you withdraw more than 20 lakh, but within 1 crore, then 2% of the excess, excess above 20 lakhs. That will be the TDS. Who will deduct this TDS, guys? This BCP will deduct the TDS. They will become the deductor. So, uh, there is a person, he has an account in bank, cooperative bank or post office. From here, he is withdrawing cash. So, if, if this person, if you look at the three years, all three years he has not filed ITR, then in that case, if he withdraws up to 20 lakh, no TDS. If he withdraws more than 20 lakh, up to 1 crore, 2% of the excess. And if he withdraws more than 1 crore, then in that case, 5% uh, of the excess. This will be the TDS. But if the account holder, any one year at least if he has filed ITR, even one out of the three years, even one out of these three years if he has filed ITR, then in that case, if he's going to withdraw up to one crore, there will be no TDS. If he withdraws more than one crore, I will deduct, BCP will deduct tax at the rate of 2% of the excess. A unique point about this section is that we deduct tax on the excess. Are you understanding? The unique point about this section is that I will be able to, uh, the unique point about this section is that we deduct tax only on the excess. So, so under section 194N, this is, uh, this is about 194N. Now, what is the amendment in 194N? One small amendment, guys, very, very basic amendment only. The amendment is that if the account holder 
happens to be a cooperative society, okay, then in that case, uh, TDS will be deducted only if the withdrawal is more than 3 crore, only then TDS will be deducted, that's all. Okay, so in under, uh, under 194N, if an account holder is withdrawing cash from BCP, then if this account holder happens to be a person where he has not filed ITR at all, XXX three years you're having, then in that case, up to 20 lakh no TDS, 20 lakh to 1 crore, 2% of excess, more than 1 crore if he withdraws, 5% of the excess. But even one out of these three years, if he has filed his ITR, then in that case, up to one crore no TDS, more than one crore, only 2% of the excess. Okay, guys. So what, what are the amendments which we've seen in TDS? Our first amendment was TDS on salary section 192. Employee has to inform the employer if he's opting out. 192A RPF withdrawal, our amendment is that if the employee has neither furnished his PAN nor he's furnished his ADAR, then in that case, the um, RPF will deduct tax at the rate of 20% and not maximum marginal rate. The next amendment was a new section 194BA, net winnings on online games, 30% is our TDS rate, okay? And then our amendment is 194N. Amendment is this, if cooperative society is withdrawing, then we will deduct tax under 194N and only if the withdrawal is more than 3 crore. Okay, now listen, I'm coming to our next section, our next amendment, which is section 206 AB. To understand the amendment, you have to understand the section first. Now, what does 206 AB talk about? 206 AB talks about a very specific situation. What specific situation? A specific situation where, let us say, the deductee, uh, let us say the deductee happens to be a person who Two years back, two years back means what? Same thing. Our previous year in the examination is 23-24. We'll ignore 22-23. We'll see 21-22. So in preceding previous year, 21-22, this deductee has not filed ITR. Okay. And in 21-22, this deductee's TDS, TCS credit put together is at least 50,000 rupees. Okay, so what is the condition? The deductee happens to be a person whose 21-22 year, if you see, did not file ITR and TDS TCS credit is at least 50,000. Okay, if uh, the deductee is such a person, then in that case, when the deductor is deducting tax, the TDS rate will change. The TDS rate will be, uh, the, what will the new TDS rate be? The TDS rate will be two times of whatever is the applicable rate. Whatever is the rate applicable in that particular transaction, two times of the applicable rate or 5%, uh, two times the applicable rate of 5%, whichever is higher. Okay. But however, section 206AB is not applicable to every TDS section. See, the deductor is going to be deducting tax under some section, right? So 206AB is not applicable to every TDS section. Like, like uh, 206AB is not applicable to section 192 TDS on salary, section 192A RPF withdrawal, section 194B lottery winnings, 194BB horse race winnings, 194BA, your net winnings from online games, which we just learned. Section 194IA, uh, rent not covered by section 194, no, 194IA, uh, immovable property. 194IB, rent which is not covered by 194I. 194M, 194N, to these sections, 206AB will not apply. Now, where is the amendment? Amendment is this. See, this 194BA newly, they introduced the section, right? So, in 206AB also, they've put this section newly. The 206AB will not apply in these cases. So, if you're deducting tax, if the deductor is deducting tax under these sections, then 206AB will not apply. Okay. If the deductor is deducting tax under any other section, like for example, 194 or 194A or 194H, 194J, 194C, in all other other sections, if the deductor is deducting tax, then the deductor will have to check. Deductee, two years back, did you file ITR? What was your TEDS, TCS credit? Was it at least 50,000? If this exists, then the deductor will deduct tax at two times of whatever is the applicable rate or 5%, whichever is higher. 
understanding like for example let's see the uh, deductor is deducting tax under section 194a 194a tds on interest guys let's say under 194a the, dedu uh, the deductor is deducting tax and two years back deducted did not file itr guys tds tcs credit was also at least 50000 guys so then in that case 206ab will come into the picture so two times of the applicable rate 194a applicable rate is 10% so two times of 10% is 20% or 5% whichever is higher so at 20% we will deduct tax getting it so 206ab when does this section come into the picture this section comes into the picture when the deductee is a defaulting deductee two years back did not file itr and two years back tds tcs credit was at least 50000 then the deductor will deduct tax at two times the applicable rate of 5% whichever is higher okay this was section 206ab this was your sixth amendment 206ab now i am take with this we done with the tds amendments now we have two amendments in tcs the next discussion I'm going to have with you is section 206C1G. Listen carefully, guys. I know we are towards the end of the session. I know you're super tired. But here, somehow bring in the energy. This is extremely important. If I am continuing to do the talking, you can continue to do the listening, right? Listen to me carefully. 206C1G, it's a TCS section. This section has two parts, okay? In the first part, what happens is, let's say, I go to an authorized dealer. Why I, why do I go to an authorized dealer? Because I want to send money to a person who is outside India. I want to remit money to a person outside India. Like for example, let's say I have my, uh, I have my younger sister in US, let us say. She's studying over there. I want to send her some money. So I can't directly send, I'll have to send through authorized dealer. You must have learned even in FEMA, in companies at guys, you can do foreign currency transactions only through an authorized dealer. So what I did is I went to an authorized dealer and I gave a sum of money to the authorized dealer. I told this authorized dealer to remit this money uh, outside India. So why did I give this money to authorized dealer? I gave this money for overseas remittance. Overseas remittance means what? I want to transfer for this money to a foreign country so for that i gave money to the authorized dealer i told him to remit this money overseas now when i give this money to the authorized dealer along with this money the authorized dealer will ask me to pay some tcs also understanding when i pay money to the authorized dealer and when i ask him to remit this money uh, outside india along with the money the authorized dealer will also ask me to pay tcs also now, how much TCS? How much TCS will they ask me to pay? Listen to me. See, if the amount of overseas remittance, if this amount of overseas remittance is within 7 lakh rupees, then there is going to be no TCS. So, when will TCS come into the picture, guys? See, we're talking about aggregate remittance. We're talking about aggregate remittance in the entire year, not one one transaction separately. Total remittance in the year is within 7 lakh. There will be no TCS. But once it crosses 7 lakh rupees, rupees that is when TCS will come into the picture so once it crosses 7 lakh rupees we will now start looking at the purpose that why why is an overseas remittance happening see if this amount happens to be more than 7 lakh rupees we will see is the remittance out of an education loan is the remittance out of education loan like for example let us say i had borrowed an education loan for the education of this person outside india and that loan only i want to remit outside india so if the remittance is out of education loan, then up to 7 lakh, there will be no TCS. If I, have, uh, if I do remittance of more than 7 lakh rupees, then there will be TCS. TCS will be 0.5%, 0.5% of the excess. Okay, if the remittance is not out of education loan, if the remittance is not out of education loan, then I will see the purpose that why am i why am i doing this overseas remittance is this overseas remittance for some medical purpose or is this overseas remittance with respect to education is it connected to education or is it connected to some medical purpose if yes then again i will see what is the excess above uh, 7 lakhs 5% of the excess is going to be the tcs rate if it is if the remittance is not out of education loan also the purpose is not medical treatment or education then in that case if the remittance is happening before 30th september 2023 
then the TCS will be at the rate of 5% uh, of the excess. And if the remittance is after 30th September 2023, then the TCS is going to be 20% of the excess. Understanding, this is the first part of 206C1G. I'll repeat once again, listen carefully. Under 206C1G, I am making an overseas remittance. See, it is these rates which have undergone a change. Okay. So, uh, I am making an overseas remittance. Now, if the overseas remittance is within 7 lakh, no TCS. If this overseas remittance is more than 7 lakhs, then I will check that am I making a remittance out of education loan? If yes, 0.5% of the excess will be the TCS, which the authorized dealer will collect from me. If it is not out of education loan, then I will see what is the purpose. Is the purpose medical treatment or education purpose? Then 5% of the excess will be the TCS. If it is neither out of education loan nor this is a purpose, then if the withdrawal is happening before 30th September 2023, 5% is a TCS rate. After 30th September 2023, 20% of the excess is a TCS rate. Understanding everybody? This is with respect to overseas remittance. Please keep in mind, I am not giving separate 7 lakh limit here, separate 7 lakh limit here, separate 7 lakh limit here. No, it is aggregate. Like for example, if I am going to, let us say, uh, do an overseas remittance of 6 lakhs here and 4 lakhs here, total overseas remittance is 10 lakhs, which has crossed 7 lakhs. So up to, uh, so up to 7 lakh, there is no TCS. So 6 lakh, no TCS. Even in this 4 lakh, balance 1 lakh, no TCS. So the remaining 3 lakhs under this category, on the 3 lakhs, 5% will be the TCS amount. You are understanding? Total I have done withdrawal, total remittance I have done 10 lakh rupees. Up to 7 lakh, no TCS. So 7 lakh, I will take 6 lakh from here and 1 lakh from here. So I still have 3 lakh under this category. So on that 3 lakh, 5% TCS will be collected from me. Now you understood, right? So 7 lakh is not a per transaction limit. 7 lakh is aggregate limit. Okay. So this is 206C, 1G first part. Now comes the second part. In the second part, what happens is, let's say, I go to make my trip. Okay. And from make my trip, I buy an overseas tour package. Overseas tour package means I am going on some foreign trip. Now, Tour package means what? Overseas indicates foreign trip, guys. Tour package indicates I am not buying just a ticket, guys. I am also buying the hotel accommodation also from Make My Trip. I am not buying just a ticket from Make My Trip. Even hotel accommodation I am buying from Make My Trip. Now, for this, I will have to pay consideration to, M to Make My Trip. Along with consideration, they will also collect TCS from me. Now, how much TCS will they collect from me? It depends. Is it before 30th September 2023 or did I buy the tour package? after 30th September 2023. If I bought the tour package before 30th September 2023, then in that case, 5% TCS they will collect from me. 5% TCS they will collect from me. Even if it is within 7 lakhs, still 5% TCS they will collect from me. But if, the, if I bought the overseas tour package after 30th September 2023, then in that case, um, up to 7 lakhs, if the tour package is up to 7 lakhs, then the TCS is going to be 5%. 5% up to 7 lakh. If uh, the tour package is for more than 7 lakh, then in that case, I'll have 20% of the uh, excess above 7 lakhs. Understanding. So, overseas tour package means what? First of all, I'm going on a foreign trip. And secondly, it's a tour package. I am not buying just travel ticket. I am not buying just the travel ticket. I am also buying... I am not buying just the travel ticket. I am also buying hotel accommodation from Make My Trip. Okay. So, in that case, we will see what is the consideration. We will see what is the consideration. We will compare the consideration. Uh, we, uh, along with the consideration, Make My Trip will also collect the TCS amount from me. Now, how much TCS will they collect from me? That depends. That is this. Uh, did I take this tour package before 30th September 2023 or after 30th September 2023? Up to 30th September 2023, if I took the overseas tour package, 5% TCS will collect from me. Even less than 7 lakhs, they will collect from me. If I'm doing, if I'm buying this overseas tour package after 30th September 2023, if it's for up to 7 lakh, 5% TCS will collect from me. If it is more than 7 lakh, then up to 5 lakh, 5%, uh, up to 7 lakh, 5% on the excess, 20% they will collect from me.
you understood so two things guys overseas remittance and overseas tour package this entire thing comes under 2061g overseas remittance if i uh, do up to 7 lakh no tcs more than 7 lakh on the excess there will be tcs uh, if the uh, overseas remittance is for education loan, 0.5%. If it is relating to med medical or education purposes, 5%. Otherwise, up to 30th September, 5%. After 30th September, 20%. If I'm making, if I'm buying an overseas tour package, irrespective of the amount, there will be TCS. The only thing is, if I bought this tour package before 30th September 2023, only 5% TCS. If I bought this tour package after 30th September 2023, up to 7 lakhs, 5%, beyond 7 lakhs, 20%, this is going to be the TCS rate. Understanding, this is 2061G. Please keep in mind, this 7 lakh is independent and this 7 lakh is independent. In overseas remittance also, I'm talking about 7 lakh. In overseas tour package also, I'm talking about 7 lakh. This 7 lakh is independent and this 7 lakh is independent. Overseas remittance to separate calculation and overseas tour package, please do another separate calculation. All right, guys. Then comes my next section, my last section under the TCS discussion, which is section 206 double C. Now, 206 double C says, listen carefully, 206 double C says, let us say I have the buyer and I have the seller. So the buyer is going to pay the seller consideration for the goods, right? Along with consideration, buyer is going to pay TCS also to the seller. Now, the seller becomes a collector of TCS, right? The buyer has to give either his PAN or his Aadhaar, at least one he has to give. If the buyer is neither giving PAN nor giving Aadhaar, that is when 206 C comes into the picture. Now, 206 C says, if the buyer is neither giving PAN nor giving Aadhaar, TCS rate will change. TCS rate will now be two times of the applicable rate or 5% uh, whichever is higher, 2 times the applicable rate of 5% whichever is higher. But if you are calculating for 206C1H, then, the t then instead of 5%, you will take the 1% number. Okay, generally it is 5%, but in, if it is 206C1H, then 1% number we take. Now the amendment is that under 206C they have prescribed that the maximum rate is going to be 20%. It should not exceed 20%. This is the amendment. So under 206 double C, if the buyer is neither giving PAN nor giving Aadhaar for TCS, then the TCS rates cha rate changes two times of the rate of 5%, whichever is higher. But in no case, it should exceed 20%. This is the amendment under 206 double C. Okay, guys. And uh, then finally, uh, we come to the last discussion, which is from the assessment procedures chapter. This is with respect to coating of PAN. See, I'll bring the amendment straight away to your screen itself. It's a very small, simple adjustment only, nothing complicated. One last amendment and then we'll discuss about 115 BAC. Coating of PAN. Coating of PAN is mandatory, guys. Like, for example, if I'm going to buy an immovable property for more than 10 lakh rupees, I'll have to mention my PAN. If I buy a vehicle, irrespective of the amount, I'll have to give my PAN. So, you know, right, there's a huge list of transactions where we have to coat our PAN. However, this requirement is relaxed when a person does not have a PAN and he makes a declaration in Form 60 giving therein particulars of the transaction. CBDT has now withdrawn the above requirement for company and firm with effect from 10th October 2023. So generally what happens is you have to mention your PAN number. But if you don't have a PAN number, uh, if you give form number 60 declaration, if you give, then you don't have to quote your PAN. It is fine. But this whole provision is now, applic now not applicable to company and firm. Not very relevant. Just be aware that a company and firm is excluded from this provision. Finally, coming to my last discussion, which is about section 115 BAC. 115 BAC tax rates, you are well aware of, all right? Apart from the tax rates, uh, what you need to know is that what are all the benefits which you will have to give up? What are the benefits which you will not get under 115 BAC? This you have to know. And also you need to know that can you keep changing like one year 115 BAC, one year op uh, optional regime, another year default regime. Can you keep changing? So two, three points you have to discuss over here. Listen carefully, simple discussion only. What are the benefits which you will not get? See, first of all, section 10 AA, uh, tax holiday, you will not get. 
10 double a tax holiday or oh, oh wait let me do one thing let me discuss the benefits with you in the same sequence in which you've learned the chapters okay like for example if you look at the salaries chapter all right in the salaries chapter, allowances you will not get. HRA, allowance, exemption and all you will not get. Allowances are generally exempt, right? That exemption you will not enjoy. But some exemptions you will still enjoy. Like for example, a transport allowance exemption for blind, deaf, dumb, handicapped employees you will still enjoy. Then a traveling allowance exemption, conveyance allowance exemption, daily allowance exemption you will still enjoy. Then even a uh, foreign allowance which is given to Indian citizens who are working uh, outside India for the government of India. You have that Indian embassy point, right? Uh, Indian citizens working outside India for the government of India. If they receive any foreign allowances, it's exempt for them. That exemption they can still enjoy. So these allowances, you can still enjoy the exemption. Other allowances, you will not get any exemption. Then LTC, leave travel concession exemption, you will not get. Then under section 16, if you see, standard deduction, you can still enjoy. But professional tax, you will not get a deduction. And also entertainment allowance deduction, you will not get. So LTC exemption, you will not get. Any allowances exemption, you will not get. But some allowances, you will still get exemption and section 16. Okay. Then your next head of income is IFHP. If it is IFHP for self for letter property, there is no change. For a self-occupied property, for unoccupied property, self-occupied and unoccupied property, section 24 deduction of interest, I will not let you enjoy. Okay, then coming to your PGBP head. In PGBP, uh, additional depreciation, you cannot enjoy anymore. And uh, section 35 AD specified business, uh, you cannot enjoy that deduction also anymore. Uh, section 35, contribution to outsiders, you cannot enjoy the deduction anymore. Okay, this is with respect to uh, PGBP. In PGBP, you have one more point. In case you have any unabsorbed additional depreciation, unabsorbed normal depreciation, no problem. Unabsorbed additional depreciation, number one, you have to ignore. And number two, you have to reverse it. How will you reverse it? You will reverse it by adding it back to the block. You will have to add it back to the block and you will have to reverse it and then you will have to ignore it. You can't carry it forward. You can't adjust it and all. Okay. Then capital gains, there is going to be no change at all. Then if you talk about IFOS, uh, in case MPs and MLAs, when they get any daily allowance, when they get any constituency allowance, it is generally exempt for them, right? But it will not be exempt anymore for them. It's going to be taxable for them. Then if you look at the clubbing chapter, when minor child's income is clubbed with your income, section 1032 exemption you get of 1500 per minor child, that exemption you will not get anymore. Then if you look at the set off and carry forward chapter, set off and carry forward chapter, if you have loss from house property, you can do intra head adjustment. You cannot do interhead adjustment. Interhead I will not allow. Intrahead you can do. You can also carry forward the loss. You can carry forward to the next year. But interhead adjustment alone I will not allow you to do. And then finally if you look at chapter 6a. Chapter 6a you will not get at all. But section 80 CCD subsection 2 you will still get. Section 80 CCH subsection 2 you will still get. And section 80 double J double A also you will still enjoy. One more thing remember. If your assessee is following 115 BAC then AMT will not apply to that assessee. Okay. So these are the benefits which you will have to <coughs> give up. <coughs> In addition to this please remember one final point. Can you keep changing? Like for example, if a SSE is not having PGBP, then one year default provision, one year normal provision, again default provision, again normal provision, like that a SSE can keep changing. But if a SSE has PGBP, then a SSE can exit only once and he can re-enter only once. Like for example, if a SSE is having PGBP, then let's say uh, Assessi decided not to follow 115 BAC, he decided to opt out. So he exited from 115 BAC and he decided to follow the normal provisions of the Act. Now he can keep following normal provisions. If he wants to re-enter 115 BAC, he can, all, he can come back. He can come back to 115 BAC. But once he comes back to 115 BAC, can he exit again? No. Exit only once is allowed. Re-enter only once is allowed. So once you've exited, 
uh, once you've opted out of 115 BAC and started applying normal provisions, now continue to apply normal provisions. You can re-enter once. You can come back to 115 BAC once. Once you re-enter, you can't exit from 115 BAC again. Now forever you have to follow 115 BAC. But if you stop having PGBP, then again you can keep changing from year to year. So if a SSE is having PGBP, you can exit once and re-enter once. Apart from that, you can't keep changing. Okay, so this is it with our entire discussion, which I had planned for you today. I think we've done a very good a discussion, a very exhaustive discussion we've done where we've not only tried covering amendments, we've also tried covering surrounding concepts so that if you get any question from any of these amendments, you have 100% understanding of the whole concept and not just understanding of just the amendment alone. This is what will actually help you tremendously in solving a paper. So with this, I'll close over here, guys. We've seen all the amendments A to Z. Each of them we have uh, completed. I'll see you in the next session wherein I will take you through the tedious revision. That's on Monday. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. I'm really, really hoping that this session made at least some difference to your preparation, gave you at least some confidence and was at least one bit you know, uh, conceptually clear for you. All right. Thank you so much. There was very good amount of energy in the chat box. It did not make me as tired as I would have been otherwise. Thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye.